everybody heard this meeting is being recorded. Um, Commissioner Stebbins, you should be all set. And we are conducting it virtually because Governor Baker offered uh, relief to bodies like ours that operate under the open meeting law once we um, had to address the pandemic now back in, in March. Um, I wanna call uh, today's meeting to order. It is November 19th. It's one week from Thanksgiving. We're at 10.03 and it's public meeting number 327. Uh, you know, I want to uh, remind everybody um, that as we, as we approach the holidays, we all know they're going to look different to us, but I think many of us can express our thanks for being able to have our jobs and to be able to, for the most part, most of us are able to work safely from home. Today, um, the national news marks that we have lost 250,000 Americans to this pandemic. It has been an enormously trying year. Um, and to all of you um, and those who are, who are out in the field, we have folks who are working on the casino floor, our GEU and our gaming agents, and of course our horse racing um, team have been out and about to all of you. You know, we, we continue to think of you and, and wish you th um, um, well. But of course, we all give thanks for the medical professionals who are right now um, being taxed, of course, in Massachusetts and across the country, and to all those who are on the front line, including, of course, our first responders like the state police, and that includes our very own GEU. So, um, as we reflect on a different Thanksgiving, I think I've said it before, the message remains the same and we um, express our thanks for all who are doing so much to keep us safe and sound. <clears throat> With that, I think I'll turn now to our, our minutes. Commissioner Stebbins. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in your packet, you have the minutes from the very lengthy uh, August 27th meeting. Thanks, Shara, for pulling those together. Uh, I'd move their approval subject to any corrections for typographical errors or any other non-material matter. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. Okay, and um, they were extensive minutes. Thank you so much, Shara, for um, that very extensive minutes and a, a well done job. But are there any edits or questions for Shara or Mr. Stebbins? Yeah, I had one question, Madam Chair, and it is for the 1121 um, um, piece portion of the minutes when we talk about the resource development split. And um, I, I actually think the uh, health and pension piece changed uh, this year, um, which is uh, listed as uh, the 4% distribution, which is listed at uh, 4060. Um, is, is Dr. Lightbaum on? She could probably verify this for me. I'm not sure I saw her. I don't name. know if I yeah. see her today. Well, I am just going to flag that for a possible technical um, correction. I believe 100% um, uh, uh, of that went to the um, went to the thoroughbred, the health, and um, that one four percent piece. So, if I okay. could just hold that to be checked, uh, Commissioner Stebbins, and we'll make that technical correction if I'm correct. Sure. I saw it in my notes here, and I just wanted to mention it. Okay, thank that you. That was a big, um, 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 important change, but also um, a very complicated discussion. So yes, agreed. No, I, I totally agree. But I just, I just wanted to flag that, and I'll, I'll, I'll verify that with uh, Dr. Lightbaum. And, uh, so we would want that um, correction. With that, it really is a correction. Yes. Uh, are there any other edits or questions for Shah or Commissioner Stebbins? All set. Then um, with that amendment for that correction, uh, I'll proceed with the vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, Sarah, thank you. Five zero with that correction noted. Okay, we're, we're going to continue then to the administrative update. Executive Director Wells, please. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. Uh, similar to what we've been doing now for weeks, if not months, 
Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Loretta Lilios, our interim director of the IEB, and, for, and to Bruce Bann, the assistant director of the IEB and the head of the gaming agents unit, uh, just to talk about what's going on at the casinos uh, and the updates, particularly in light of the pandemic. So I'll start with Loretta. Thanks, Karen. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, at your meeting two weeks ago, you adopted uh, COVID-19 related health and safety measures uh, aimed at ensuring that the licensees comply with the governor's new order, uh, order number 53, and our requirements that you approved that day two weeks ago parallel the governor's order and went into effect on Friday, November 6th. Uh, the order was issued in response to evolving health data uh, and trends and uh, have led to adjustments in some of the safety measures to continue to mitigate the risks of transmission of the coronavirus. Uh, in essence, the new requirements require the licensees to close to the public and close all activities and services to the public between the hours of 9.30 p.m. and 5 a.m. and they apply to the amenities at the gaming establishments as well. Uh, with respect to the restaurant amenities, the governor has allowed diners who are already seated uh, to finish their meal so long as they depart no longer than 10 p.m. And that rule has been uh, adopted by the commission for the restaurant amenities at the casinos as well. So there have been almost two full weeks of operation under these new measures, and there have been two full weekends of operations under these measures. And from an operational point of view, the licensees have done an excellent job with the 9.30 p.m. closing. And I also want to recognize the gaming agent staff, the GEU, and our IT, who have worked in conjunction with uh, the licensees, including uh, in an on-site monitoring capacity uh, to help uh, make this uh, smooth. Remember, these are not establishments that were designed to close on a nightly basis, so it has taken uh, significant adaptability. Uh, the licensees have developed and implemented a communications program to the public around this on their websites and social media, and they've put uh, plans in place that call for things like public service announcements uh, within the gaming establishment in the period leaving, leading up to the closing time, uh, sweeping the floor uh, to prevent guests from further play uh, as they near the closing time, signage on the gaming tables about the timing of the dealing of the last shoe, uh, verbal announcements from dealers uh, and so forth. And Mr. Band uh, uh, is prepared to give you more details on specific measures that have have proven to be uh, effective. The only issue that I heard about uh, that occurred once and did not reoccur was on the first Saturday night of this order uh, at Encore, there was congestion leading out of the garage at closing time. It was a matter of driving out of the garage and merging onto the street. Folks were in their cars, so there was no um, uh, health uh, related concerns. There was not, you know, congestion of people outside of their cars. Uh, but, you know, we've all experienced uh, that snaking through a garage uh, when an event empties out. It's not fun. Uh, that has not repeated itself. And, and GEU is monitoring the closing time and ensuring that uh, traffic control is able to handle that group, group exit. And that's the only issue that I've, I've heard about. The numbers, the occupancy numbers, have stayed below the 50% of the reduced occupancy numbers uh, that you uh, have ordered in your requirements. Uh, but uh, really, the message is the licensees are continuing to work uh, very hard at these measures. Um, there's, you know, continues to be a high degree of, of cooperation. Um, I'd like to invite Bruce to uh, give you some additional details, and then, of course, we can uh, try to answer anything that you may have. Yes, uh, uh, the licensees have really been doing a fantastic job with uh, getting the casinos cleared and keeping the people socially distanced. Uh, they've uh, utilized some uh, emergency exits as well to clear the, uh, the buildings. Uh, 
the uh, turning off of the slot machines to uh, at, you know various hours and stuff have, have uh, helped. So IT has really been a great help with this, uh, and there's been no problems with, uh, with that. The, the game closures have gone really smoothly. Uh, I I was expecting some hiccups with this, but we have not seen any at all. So uh, kudos to the casinos for for making this go uh, much smoother than I thought it was going to go. So uh, uh, things have gone gone very well. If anybody has any questions, I, Loretta and I will certainly field them. Questions for Loretta and Bruce. <laughs> Again, I, I think no comment is, uh, is good news. Uh, commissioners, you, we're very pleased with, with this continuing compliance and, and appreciate the, the cooperation of uh, all three licensees around these these tough new restrictions, but ones that we are all understanding are being driven by public health metrics. No comments? Thank you for the thorough reports. Thank you. Karen? Thank you. Karen? Pardon me, I was muted. Uh, yeah, so that concludes the administrative update for today. Uh, I did want to wish everybody, uh, particularly on our staff, uh, uh, very happy Thanksgiving. I realize, as Kathy said, this is going to be a different Thanksgiving, but I uh, can't thank the staff enough for the work they've done in this most difficult year. And so I really hope everyone enjoys the holiday coming up. Thanks. Karen, were you going to take this um, opportunity to make an introduction? I think we we're going to do that uh, when Jill does her item on number five. Uh, so North standby. So I'm we, just we do have a jump, plan for that. Jumping the gun a little bit. Yeah, right. that's okay. Thank, no, we, thank we, you we, so we, much. We, we, we work the plan there. Okay, thank you so much. Um, then we're continuing on to, uh, to item number four. Um, Community Affairs Division Chief Delaney, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, so up for you uh, today, we have Encore's third quarter report. Um, as you remember, we gave our licensee some relief from the quarterly report requirements when the uh, casinos were shut down. So this is the first uh, quarterly report since uh, they reopened. Um, and with that, I will now turn it over to Jackie Crum, uh, Senior Vice President and General Counsel for Encore for Encore's third quarter report. Thank you, Joe, and uh, good morning, morning commissioners. So, uh, good morning. while I look forward to our presentation about the quarter, which was a very good quarter, uh, I wanted to echo Loretta's statements earlier. As you know, our world changed yet again this month, and I'd like to thank the commission and the staff. Executive Director Well, Loretta, you've got so many titles now, I don't know which one you would prefer me to use. Huh. <laughs> uh, Bruce, so, Lewis, Burke, Captain Connors, the GU, Katrina and the IT team, to name just a few, for helping us discover how we can actually open and close uh, a building that was never designed to be opened or closed. Uh, I'd also be remiss if I didn't thank our employees who have once again demonstrated that they can be nimble and adaptable. With that, let's talk about the past. So, I'm going to try to share this. PowerPoint presentation. Um, and Jackie, just a reminder, I think when you're just a little bit closer to the microphone, we can really hear you clearly. So okay. Thank you. Got it. Is it sharing? Not quite yet. Yeah, you know, it's not letting me share it. It says there's security issues. Um, oh. Jackie, I, I've got it loaded up here. I can, I can, I can share right. it on my end, and you can just cue okay. me to switch. Uh, yeah, let's take a second to get it up. There we go. There we go. Thank you, Joe. And one second. Let me get to slideshow. I keep trying to control it and I'll have to step back and let you <laughs> navigate. Um, thank you. Okay, so to talk about the gaming revenue, uh, as I said, we were very proud of what we were able to achieve in the third quarter. Uh, as you know, the month of July reflects a, uh, about two thirds of a month, which is why it's slightly lower than um, our results in both August and September. Um, you can see that uh, our slots, GGR, increased uh, in July, August, and September uh, compared to past months. 
And uh, as a result, we were able to uh, pay up to 28 million in state taxes for the third quarter. So Joe, if we can go to the next slide. Our lottery sales continue to increase and we continue to engage with the lottery in discussions about how we can promote the lottery. Uh, one of the items that we're considering for the for next month or, is to have a giveaway of lottery tickets. I know it's been a popular item at some of the other, some of our other licensees. And uh, so we've been talking to them about how we can accomplish that. So lottery sales for the third quarter were $421,804. So on the employment, uh, this chart is a little misleading and I wanna be clear about it. So it says the total number of our employees is 3,604. But what that includes is employees who are furloughed or employees who are hourly employees and who are not receiving, uh, who are not currently receiving any hours. So a more realistic number is 2,600 actively working uh, employees for the third quarter of uh, 2020. Um, so on Massachusetts residents, uh, we are still at the 89% mark. We are still uh, over 86% uh, on local hosts and surrounding communities. We have exceeded our goals for minority and veteran employees and continue to work on, on, uh, on making sure we meet our goal for the women employees. So on operating spend, we're continuing to focus on this. Uh, frankly, it was a little bit more difficult because of our closure. Um, but I think we we're close to our total, which is our annual goal of 25% for the third quarter. We were at 21%. Uh, this reflected, uh, we, we met our goal for women, women's business enterprises. We were slightly below for both minority and veterans business enterprises, but we were still able to spend uh, 14 million, over $14 million on uh, minority veterans and women business enterprises. On the local spend, uh, again, this is uh, frankly something that suffered because of our closure, but uh, this is our quarterly spend. Um, these are aspirational goals. They're not uh, requirements, uh, but it is something that we take very seriously and will continue to grow the expenditures in our, uh, in our communities. We, we will say that we have run into some issues in identifying businesses within these communities and intend to reach out to um, to the communities directly to assist us on a going forward basis in terms of identifying potential businesses that we can do business with. One of the ones that we did want to highlight, and this is maybe one of the good things that has come out of, maybe the only good thing that has come out of the pandemic, is that we purchased approximately $110,000 worth of hand sanitizer and other health and safety supplies from Quintana Supply during the third quarter. Jackie, do you happen to know what community they're from? I don't, but I will find out. Okay. And, and was that their primary um, product or did they pivot? Uh, no, yeah. I believe they actually pivoted and they were very helpful in helping us secure uh, additional supplies. So it, it was something that they grew their business to adapt to. Excellent, thank you. So on the compliance side, I'm pleased to say that we've, we've seen a decreased number of miners uh, who are intercepted, miners at the slots, miners at table games, miners consuming alcohol. I think one of the primary reasons for this is we installed, um, before closure actually, uh, Veridox machines at each entrance. And our security team calls them sort of toaster machines and essentially it allows you to uh, insert the ID and it gives you a real time uh, feedback as to whether the ID is fake, whether there are any issues with it. Jackie, can I ask one question about that? I, I agree that the numbers are, are improved. They're very good. I didn't know if you had any in, uh, information on the one miner who was there for two hours and six minutes. So, and I, I'll need to verify that this was the miner, but if I'm thinking about the right person, I think this person came onto the gaming floor, was not asked for ID uh, at the gaming floor, appeared to be be uh, older than the person seemed, spend some time in one of our restaurants uh, for an extended period of time. Okay, thank you. So on our promotions and marketing, we uh, continue to try. Uh, what we launched is what we call the HERO program, and it's a token of our appreciation 
for uh, for everyone who has provided such extraordinary services during during this pandemic. So what we've done is we've upgraded um, any members of the Hero Program to our platinum tier rewards, and we offer them uh, the amenities that come along with that status. And on special events, um, we are very proud to say that we received the 2020 James D.P. Farrell Award for Brownfields Remediation as the project of the year. They recognized, uh, as I look out right now and I see the beautiful water <laughs> and our living shoreline, they recognized uh, us for our efforts there. This should be the project of the decade. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the uh, ways that we've tried to pivot is we've um, developed a specialty in what we call micro weddings. These are very, very small events, obviously less than 10. Um, we've, had a, we've had four this year and we've got a few more scheduled. Uh, we're really trying to push this out. It's a great way for people who want to celebrate during this time to do so in a uh, safe and an appropriate manner. And finally, what we did, we did a deal where we can now allow our patrons to go online and book, um, book a marina reservation. So we're, we realized that um, <laughs> our patrons still are very interested in visiting our resort through uh, a water front. And this is a way that private vessel uh, uh, owners can make a reservation for a short time stay at our dock. Jackie, does that include kayaks? Uh, as I've said, we will make special exceptions for kayaks. We do not currently have a kayak launch. <laughs> I'll have to wait for that phase, phase down the road. Phase. <laughs> so to Thank that, I'll open it up to any questions. Yeah. I know we asked questions along the way, but commissioners? Uh, I'll start with um, with a couple. Uh, Jackie, uh, thank you for that presentation. Um, just, uh, it's not necessary to go back to the slide, but the slide of employment, uh, you mentioned um, about 2,600 uh, um, people being the most uh, realistic number. Um, but we're looking, of course, at a period of the whole quarter. Is that an average? Is that a point, a midpoint in time? Or is that the most recent number? What else can you tell us about, about that figure? Sure. So the 2,600 was the average number of active working employees during the third quarter. Uh, following the additional restrictions, uh, that has had an impact on another, approximately a thousand employees have been impacted by that, whether through furlough or uh, a reduction in hours or uh, they're not receiving hours. Right. And, um, you know, this, is, this has been a very fluid uh, situation, uh, needless to say. Um, can you speak a little bit about um, you know, what uh, uh, some of the employees that you furlough, what is the, an expectation if things uh, get eased uh, a little bit more later on? What's, uh, what else can you tell us relative to your process of bringing people back depending on the circumstances changing? Sure, so what we're trying to do is be incredibly flexible. As, in addition to, you know, obviously as business, as business demands increase, we'll reopen venues and bring people back. However, what we're also trying to do is reach out to our furloughed uh, employee base. If we do have any open positions, the very first place we look is at our furloughed employees. So we've had a number of employees who've come back from different roles um, to the extent that they, you know, they've had the skill set that would fit that role, um, both on the management level and on the uh, hourly level. And does that mean additional training, I suspect, uh, or some kind of um, you it, know, it is readjustment? Additional training. Yeah, so as we bring people back, but we've also tried, you know, for instance, we, we have a lot of great talent in the hotel, and we're very, we're very aware that uh, we'd like to reopen that as soon as possible, and we don't want to lose that talent. So we've, we have tried to move people around so that they are able to provide us services during this time. And we've tried not to furlough people uh, if, if at all possible. Unfortunately, uh, I think every single department has been impacted. And so we do have to take that into consideration as well. well thank you for that. It, uh, it, it occurs to me that it's quite a challenge to have to be able to be so flexible and reactive to try to get you know, as many people in the right um, uh, positions and reacting to the circumstances around you. So uh, thank you for those um, highlights. And as I said, it's been, our employees have just been incredible. What we're asking them to do and 
the way they're performing is outstanding. We couldn't be more proud of our employees. Other questions or comments for, for Jackie? Well, I can just say uh, thank you on behalf of all of us, Jackie. We're happy to um, resume this cadence of hearing from, from you. It, uh, it's been a difficult period. Um, there will be challenges we know going ahead given the new restrictions, but I think um, getting this, uh, quarter, these quarterly reports back um, onto this cadence will be really helpful. Um, and we'll just have to uh, address all the, the various assumptions that are coming with this particular period. It's going to be very hard to develop any ideas around trends, et cetera. I, I think that's, in, you know, to answer uh, Commissioner Zuniga's question, you know, what have we told employees who are on furlough? We, we try to communicate with them regularly. We try to tell them, you know, we miss them, which we do. Um, we'd love them to come back. We can't give them any guarantees at this point. And, and if I may, I could, um, I, I should go back to the good news uh, of the, uh, that you started with relative to the revenues. Um, uh, as, but as you say, uh, Madam Chair, I'm very interested in how those uh, revenues change with the reduction in, in hours. Um, it's yeah. of course um, something that is very hard to forecast, um, but uh, uh, one more reason we, uh, we appreciate all uh, these, these quarterly reports. That's right, that's right. So thank you. And we also appreciate your expressing your gratitude for our team. I know that they were innovative and, and really helpful um, uh, for, your, for your team. So thank you for that. Congrats. Very to much all. so. Uh, switching off the machines was a, was a huge value add for us. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you elaborated on that, but it turns out that we had the ability to, to do something more than what the licensee could do. And it was really helpful and it protected the patrons and and, um, and allowed full compliance, so all very good news. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll I haven't have seen your face for a long time, so it's nice to see you. Nice to see you all too. Okay. okay and that, that concludes our report. Okay, and um, you're, you're up in a little bit. So thank you, Jill. We'll go to number five then. I'll be standing by. You'll be standing by, thank you. Uh, uh, Jill, Director of um, Workforce Supplier and Diversity Placement. Good morning. There you are, Jill, good morning. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Jill, do you want to do the introduction of North or shall I do that? I know we had, to, we had sort of connected the, some emails yeah. about the intro. So oh, either way. you know what, why don't you do the honors? Okay, I would be happy to do that. So um, I did want to mention we've got, uh, North Brownsville is the new uh, property, Brownsville is the new property manager at uh, PPC uh, Planners Park Casino. So he's replaced Lance George, who has been so successful, he was promoted to another position. Uh, so I just really wanted to welcome North. Um, we've had a conversation this week, great conversation. I'm very excited to work with him. Um, and he comes to us, um, he had been the uh, general manager of Ameristar Blackhawk. Uh, and then prior to joining Penn uh, in 2017 as the AGM of Hollywood Casino at Charlestown Races, uh, he had worked at Harris and the Caesars organization where he uh, served in a variety of roles, uh, primarily on the ops side of the business. And then during his uh, tenure at Ameristar Blackhawk, he was really a key contributor to integrating the property into the Penn portfolio. If you remember the, um, you know, the pinnacle a merger and that, that was a big uh, operation for the uh, Penn National Company and he was very successful in that area. So I just want to say uh, hello and welcome to North and we're happy to have you here and just give you an opportunity to say hello to the commissioners. I know you're going to be meeting with them individually but just wanted to say hello and thank you. Thank you very much, Executive Director Wells, and uh, good morning to you, Madam Chair, and the rest of the commissioners. Uh, I look forward to working uh, with all of you and taking over the great work that Lance has done, making sure that we uphold the highest standards and the bar that he set for us. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to operate in the state of Massachusetts, and we uh, continue our commitment um, that have been laid out for us. So thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to speaking to the commissioners that I've not yet had the opportunity to speak with one-on-one. -on -one. 
Um, and thank you again for the very warm welcome. Great. I'll turn it over to you, Jill. Great, thank you. And, and um, let me extend my welcome as well uh, to, uh, to you as well. We um, didn't say it, but welcome. <laughs> we were all careful on our muting, but welcome, North. Thank you. Thank you. Jill. Um, so, so one of the um, areas that uh, Plain Ridge Park Casino has um, really demonstrated their commitment to is, is diversity and, um, and also the procurement of um, goods and services from local companies. Um, so here to present their new plan, um, their new procurement um, uh, diversity plan for operational goods and services um, is Dana Fortney, the Vice President of Finance for Plain Ridge Park Casino. Um, and just um, by way of reference, um, license condition four of their updated uh, or renewed um, gaming license award requires that they submit um, an affirmative marketing program for the provision of goods and services procured by the gaming establishment. Um, and so this plan um, that you have uh, with you today um, satisfies that requirement. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dane, uh, Dana Fortney um, to give you a high level overview. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Can everyone hear me? Can, good morning, Dana. Perfect. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning to present our updated purchasing practices plan for local and traditionally disadvantaged and diverse businesses. Before I dive into the details that we've edited, I'd like to say thank you to Director Griffin, her team, and the Commission for their partnership in helping Plain Ridge grow and maintain our diverse fund over the past five years of operations. We've had a great story. In that time frame, we had an overall diverse spend goal of 21% and we ended at 29%. While it was hard work done by many, the support and continued outreach with potential new ven vendors has been so helpful for us. Well, on the topic of the past five years, we've grown relationships with many vendors. I can't name them all here, but they include Camelot M Enterprises, Mansfield Paper Company, Mac Graphics, Millhench Industrial Supply, and Kitridge Food Service. Kit Ridge is a particularly interesting story that I know we've mentioned to the commission before. Plain Ridge began doing business with them in 2015 and through our company's diversity program, which I'll touch on here shortly, Kit Ridge is now a vendor for over 10 casinos in the Penn National portfolio. They are also now the preferred distributor of food and beverage smallwares in the Eastern region. With that, I'll move on to the edits that we've made to the plan. To start, we removed some language throughout the document that focused on pre-opening spend as it's no longer relevant. We also rearranged a few sections to better the overall flow. In the introduction, we added some wording around our focus on diversity as well as stating our continued commitment to our goals. Those goals are 6% for minority-owned businesses, 12% for women-owned businesses, and 3% for veteran-owned businesses. In the reporting schedule section, we updated the events in which we focused our outreach efforts over the first five years. Some highlights in this list are that we've been a member of multiple regional chambers of commerce, as well as members of the Greater New England Minority Development Council and the Center for Women and Enterprise since 2015. We've also participated in both organizations, expos and conferences over the last five years. Uh, one great example I would add for the Center for Women and Enterprises, they held an, a, a virtual event on October 6th and we just picked up a new vendor from them, um, Boston Building Maintenance or Purify, and they do cleaning relating to COVID. So they are a new segment of that company that has opened up since the pandemic began. Moving on to the section of continued growth of the plan, we highlighted the supplier selection criteria that we use. Our criteria was adopted from the American Gaming Association standards for the gaming industry. 
But what I feel is the most important for us to highlight in this section is that we afford diverse vendors a 5% price consideration over other bids. We want to work with these diverse vendors and this allows them to have a competitive advantage. In areas of ongoing eligible spend, not much changed here. The section was relocated, but the ongoing eligible needs for us continue to be the same. With the communication strategy section, we highlighted similar organizations that I have mentioned earlier and how we've been able to partner with them to get word out on how to become a vendor with us. Then next is the biggest section that I want to go through with you, and that's the diversity committee. We have a company-wide diversity committee for Penn National Gaming that has a commitment on fostering an environment of respect, empathy, and equal opportunity. This committee is focusing on diversity both internally and externally. Eli Heward, as many of you know and have, have spoken with in the past, is our Regional Director of Strategic Sourcing for the Northeast, and he is a member of the Purchasing Subcommittee. Through this subcommittee, Penn has recently become a member of the National Minority Supplier Development Council. Eli attended the Council's virtual conference just last week, and we're looking forward to the great work that the committee will be doing over the next few years to expand the program. Lastly, we updated the definitions of diverse, the diverse vendors to match those from the Commonwealth's website. So with that, I'll open up to any questions that you may have. Questions for Dana or Jill? Um, sure, Madam Chair. Um, just some, some comments uh, to Dana and a couple of questions. First of all, thanks for Penn National's great work. Uh, the great work you've done working with the local chambers of, <clears throat> excuse me, the local chambers of commerce and other organizations uh, that is, I think, help you be successful. Um, I, I also thank you for noting the, the great work that uh, you've done with Kittredge, um, the great Western Massachusetts company, <laughs> uh, Western Mass business, so I can be proud of that. Uh, but what I think it shows is that, you know, the benefits of the gaming statute when it comes to spending can impact more businesses across the state. We know employment tends to be more local, but your purchasing can really have an impact statewide. And I think the, the great work that you've done with Kittred shows that. Absolutely. Um, just kind of a general question. I think many of us were worried at the introduction of gaming of whether you would be able to find local vendors and allow them to have the capacity um, in the overall business sense to keep up with, you know, a company like Penn and our other licensees. What, what experience are you seeing about, you know, some of these small businesses and just their ability to keep up with um, your guidelines, your requirements, you know, do they have the technical and business capacity to uh, to meet your needs. What's been your overall sense of that over the last? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say since my time here, we have had vendors that are absolutely ready and prepared. But I also know that prior to my time here, they they've grown with us. So maybe we started out our spend small. And then as we learned each other and the relationship that we needed to build, we've been able to expand the product lines that we can purchase from them and or the volumes that we're able to purchase from them. So it's been a great way to see them grow right along with us over the last five years. But I can't think of any instance that we've had where, you know, there's an, a vendor that we've identified that really doesn't have the infrastructure yet to keep up with us. Um, so it's a great question, but it, it's been a great story. That's great. That's great to hear. Thanks, Dana. If, if I might add, um, Dana, that's really impressive that during a pandemic, you're able to pick up a new vendor um, that specializes in COVID cleaning. Good for that vendor to realize that would be a growing need. And um, I just think it's, it's really impressive that you're able to identify this vendor and bring them in for this really important um, piece of cleaning that's so needed right now. So congrats on that piece. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Um, Madam Chair, if I might, um, one thing I was excited to see in the plan, actually two things, um, the 5% um, consideration, um, price consideration for um, diverse businesses, 
I thought was um, really showed their commitment um, to diversity and local procurement. But the other um, area that I was excited to see um, was the accelerated payment program that they're looking to launch in the future. Um, credit card payment and immediate or uh, quick payment is very important, especially for smaller businesses. So uh, I thought that was um, really um, a great introduction and I look forward to hearing how that goes. Especially during these lean times. Uh, right. That right. will make an enormous difference. But commissioners, um, I think this is a very strong plan and um, um, I recommend um, approval. Yeah, I was just going to highlight the point that Jill made, um, uh, which is, you know, these uh, sometimes these very these suppliers and 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 and, um, uh, and and businesses they operate on very tight margins. So having a consideration like like they have done for the uh, small business and and diverse business is is probably a, a, a really important step in, in, in significantly increasing that. So. Um, I agree with Jill's um, assessment, overall assessment, and um, and Dana, thank you for your great presentation. Then I believe, uh, Jill, you've made your formal recommendation and you are looking for a, a vote today from the commission. If there are no other questions for Dana, excellent report, Dana, and an exciting report. Uh, so thank you. And then I would look for a motion Commissioner Stebbins, are you set? Sure, uh, Madam Chair. And first of all, Dana, please thank Eli for us. Uh, we miss seeing him uh, on some of these calls as well, but understand his uh, his larger role within the company and that, that speaks well of his great work and, uh, and the great success at PPC. Um, Madam Chair, I'd move that the commission approve the diversity plan for the procurement of goods and services at Plain Ridge Park Casino as discussed for today. Second. Any questions or comments? Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zinniga? Aye. Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. I vote yes. Thank you, Sharon. Five zero. Thank you. Excellent work, Dana. Jill? Great, commissioners. We'll move on to um, the Regional Tourism, Marketing, and Hospitality Plan. Um, as referenced by the renewal of the category two gaming license, um, license condition six requires compliance with a regional tourism marketing and hospitality plan, which um, shall be subject to approval by an amendment at the direction of the commission. Such plan shall be prepared in furtherance of uh, uh, chapter 23K section one six, and in consultation with the Regional Tourism Council. I'll just report that um, um, Plain Ridge um, submitted a draft updated hospitality plan on September 20th and revised that plan um, in mid-November following feedback from MGC staff and um, subsequent meetings with the director Director Oral of the Mass Office of Travel and Tourism, and Martha Sheridan, President and CEO of the Greater Boston Convention and Visitors Bureau. Um, in the plan, um, Plain Ridge Park Casino pledges to work collaboratively with various entities within the travel and tourism sector of Massachusetts, including the Greater Boston area, Bristol County, Plymouth County, Cape Cod, Metro West, and others. Um, I'm gonna introduce you to um, Michelle Collins, Vice President of Marketing. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Can everyone hear me? Yes, good morning. Yes, good morning, Michelle. It's nice to see everyone. Um, today, I'll be providing an update, as Jill mentioned, on the uh, marketing and hospitality plan in accordance with license condition number six. 
As noted in the plan that we provided, we will continue to expand on the initiatives that have been established over the last five years, uh, focusing on leveraging our proximity to the various major attractions, as well as supporting other regions and especially local businesses throughout the Commonwealth. I wanna note that during this critical time um, across Massachusetts and the country, Plainridge continues to follow Massachusetts COVID-19 orders and the CDC guidelines for the safety of our guests and employees. We plan to modify uh, this proposal as we work together with the communities to help stop the, pred the spread of COVID-19. And uh, to show our, our commitment, we recently took the Boston Safe and Strong Business Pledge and we understand that as I do highlight some of these initiatives, we're gonna to have to pivot and be creative and make changes as needed. But we understand the importance of travel and, and tourism. And while we're in this pandemic, our focus will be keeping the revenue within our state. Um, we wanna to continue to build off the great partnerships and all the efforts we've achieved over the last five years. Uh, we'll work co collaboratively, as Jill mentioned, travel and tourism sector of Massachusetts, including the greater Boston area, Bristol County, Plymouth County, Cape Cod, Metro West, and the others. Uh, as Jill also mentioned, I did have discussions with Executive Director Keiko Aral from the Office in Travel Tourism, as well as Martha Sheridan, President and CEO of the Greater Boston Convention and Visitors Bureau. We had uh, lots of discussions back and forth and we came up with several opportunities that I believe um, are outside of the box. They're creative and it will really allow us to show our support and expand this in initiative across the, uh, the My Choice database that we have access to. A few of the highlights that I want to mention that we haven't done in the past and I believe uh, will help us be successful is we will feature um, local attractions and events on our websites, our social media, and in email in flipbooks and direct mail. What this means is I'll work directly with the Office of Tourism and the, the bureaus to identify different events going on throughout the quarter and share that with the community. We will also work to promote the My Local Massachusetts campaign, creating awareness and doing cross-marketing efforts that support small local businesses and encourage residents of Massachusetts to eat local, stay local, and shop local. We will do this by featuring a display on property of a local retail business, hotel, or restaurant, offering guests a free play offer or employees a gift card if they bring in their receipt from that local shop during the month that we are um, displaying. Uh, Plain Ridge will work with surrounding attractions and venues within Massachusetts, as we always do, to develop programs and identify synergies for us to work together. In addition, we understand the importance of keeping our ideas fresh and the need to pivot when necessary. And we will meet quarterly with the travel and tourism sector sectors to discuss new ideas and opportunities as we highlighted in this um, presentation and plan. I do wanna thank Jill for all of her help and support as well as um, the Office of Travel and Tourism and the regional chambers and the many partnerships that we've developed with hotels, Rentham Outlets, Patriot Place, the list can go on and on. Um, I think we've had a really successful five years and I look forward to what we can come up with over the next five years. Any questions? Thoughtful report. Commissioners. Yeah, questions from yeah, Stewart. Madam Chair, um, I just want to jump in and, and, and thank Michelle. This is um, an incredible display of leadership on behalf of PPC. Uh, I think we've seen it over the last five years. We're looking to see it in the next five years. Um, the ability to understand and recognize how uh, the pandemic has impacted uh, the hospitality sector, which everybody is... Uh, suggesting may take longer to recover than some other industry sectors as we come out of this. Uh, but I just got to uh, tip my hat to PPC for their leadership, you know, adjusting this plan uh, again to, uh, to address the COVID related impacts.
but your continued work with partners uh, at the state and local level, uh, you know, encouraging patrons to buy local and spend locally during this time frame. You know, I hope you extend that message also to your many, many employees who come from the region. Um, but, uh, you know, your involvement in the local mass effort is, uh, is uh, hopefully a model others will follow. It's, uh, it's great work. And, um, you know, I think it just, I mean, really encouraged by the work that the town of Plainville, Rentham and Foxborough have done to really create that region of the state as a destination for, for local visitors and hopefully one day more out of state visitors to come and experience everything that region has to offer. So congratulations, Michelle, a great plan put together. Thanks for being a leader. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, uh, I heartily endorse uh, this new revised plan for, uh, for their new license period. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Cameron, are you leading in? Uh, I was not, but I, I would echo Commissioner Stebbins' thoughts that it, this is difficult and to give an enthusiastic report like this. Uh, Michelle, I, it's much appreciated and um, some of the innovative new things you're putting together um, as far as spending locally are just terrific. So congratulations. Thank you. Other comments? I, again, I echo it, um, a big thank you, Michelle. Um, local, local, local. We like that very much. And uh, I think that um, for you, North, this really, this report reflects what we saw um, during the relicensing period. Um, the, the strength of your organization as a community partner, um, and, you know, and to use Commissioner Stebbins' term, a, a leader. So um, we thank you for that, um, that vision and that plan going forward. Uh, you have demonstrated to us during the relicensing period, you know, really what a very strong, valuable partner you are to not only the immediate community, but surrounding regions. And, and as demonstrated today, really extends throughout the Commonwealth. So thank you. Thank you. And I guess, uh, Jill, you're making a formal recommendation with respect to this. I, I hear Commissioner Stebbins and Commissioner Cameron's endorsements. Yes, yeah, so um, as evidenced by this uh, plan, um, Plain Ridge has been a very strong partner to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, um, especially in the tourism sector. So I recommend um, strongly approval of this plan. So we'll need a um, vote. Uh, Commissioner Stevens, do you have a motion? Uh, I do, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve the tourism plan submitted by Plain Ridge Park Casino as discussed here today. Second. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. Any further questions or comments for either Dana um, uh, or, or Michelle? I know this is really Michelle's matter, but okay. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Enthusiastic yes. Thank you. Five Thank zero. you, Commissioners. Thank you so much to all of you from uh, PPC uh, North. Welcome. This was your first uh, meeting with us. We're sad that it's not in person, but it almost feels like that. So thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Okay, moving then on to item number six. Back to you, Joe. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, so today we're asking for a vote on um, the Community Mitigation Fund Guidelines for 2021. Um, so the last time the Commission met on this item, um, we had just, uh, we had drafted the guidelines and they were opened up for public comment. So we received uh, one set of comments uh, from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, uh, which we've included in your packet. Um, after we reviewed those uh, comments, which were, were really a, a good set of comments, um, we really cover almost all of the items in that comment really under our guidelines, but they maybe weren't uh, uh, pulled out quite as much as, as, as that has been suggested. So we made, a couple of very minor tweaks um, to the guidelines to reflect 
uh, some of those uh, requests from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Um, so um, the uh, sort of the next steps again after we're asking for a vote today on the guidelines, and um, after uh, the vote, uh, the next steps would be we would start our, our solicitation on Monday for projects under the 2021 guidelines, which is great. We're out a little bit earlier than we have been for the last couple of years, which will give our uh, people putting their applications together, give them a little bit more time to do that. Um, and then we'll, what we're doing uh, internally is we're going to be doing three workshops for uh, potential uh, grantees. Uh, the first one will be in the middle of December, on December 15th, uh, for those communities that still have reserves, unspent reserves uh, with us. And what, we were hope, what we're hoping to do with that meeting is get everybody together and go over some of the examples of things that people can use that money for. And as you know, under the guidelines, we're saying that, that, that these communities have until the end of calendar year 2021 to uh, program that money to be spent. We're not saying it all has to be out the door, but they have to have a, a real plan to get that spent. Um, and then in January, uh, we're gonna do two workshops, one particularly for workforce since that you know, those workforce grants are, are very much different from most of our other grants, um, uh, just in, in the way that, that they're managed. So we're gonna do one workshop for uh, the workforce grants and then a second workshop for all of the other grants. And, you know, the idea there is um, with these workshops is to hopefully get, you know, people maybe to think outside the box a little bit or to get a bit more creative uh, on some of their applications and in, uh, you know, in some cases, our hope is that we get, you know, some better quality applications by giving people some ideas and some guidance on, on, how, on what we would like to see. And with that, um, I'll open it up to any questions that the commission may have. Or, and, um, and I think Shara has uh, prepared a uh, motion. Commissioners, do you have questions for Joe or Mary? Um, Madam Chair, just jump in and, and, and compliment Joe and his team on, on the great work they've done to get the guidelines um, in their new form and fashion, incorporate uh, the very thoughtful feedback we had from, uh, from our friends at the MAPC, uh, and, as, and as well, uh, and I know, Chair, this was a, a, a brainstorm of yours to make sure that we reached out to these communities and offered these kind of orientation best practice sessions for them to have a chance to listen into to to Joe, Joe's point to make sure that they can produce good applications that align very well with the guidelines which change from year to year and uh, and again we want to see successful applications come in when we can so good work Joe thank you yeah and, and I meant to mention Tanya too my my apologies your your strong team here um, yeah, I, I think I went through the guidelines last night and I thought that everything, the changes we discussed and, um, and, and suggested were, were in, in, and expected are included. Extensive, um, extensive reforms really. And, and even though they look a lot alike, there are some really thoughtful changes from last year, including the simple community impact uh, Award the, the name change means a lot, Joe. When I reread it last night, it meant a lot. So thank you. Other comments, commissioners? My only comment is that um, I agree once again agreeing with Commissioner Stebbins. Hmm. No, just the uh, responsiveness. Surprised by that. <laughs> the responsiveness to the needs of the communities is so um, apparent in reading this. It's not just hey, this is the way we do it. It's we're going to help you do it better. And of course, the responsiveness to uh, public comments. That means a lot to people who take the time to put a comment in that, uh, yeah. that it is, it is uh, reflected in the document. So great work to the team. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for sharing this, the schedule on the, um, the workshops. I, I do hope that they work out well. It's, of course, it's a little different virtually. So um, 
we'll keep our fingers crossed that you, you get the um, attendance that you're hoping for. Good. So uh, at this point, it's hard to believe, Mary, that we're at the point where we're adopting these. Um, she's not nodding her head. So here we go. I think we need to have a motion. Um, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to move that the Commission approve the final version of the 2021 Community Mitigation Fund Guidelines as provided in the Commissioner's Packet subject to any grammatical or immaterial changes. Second. Commissioners, you're all set. Commissioner O'Brien and Commissioner Zuniga? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, then Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. I don't, yes, thank you so much. Uh, a lot of work and now the next phase, which is also very exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much for, for all your hard work. Okay. So um, we're moving on now to item number seven. Back to Executive Director Wells. Thank you. Yes, Madam Chair. So I'm going to have uh, Director Griffin join me on this uh, presentation. We met earlier this week just to review these items uh, for the presentation here today. So as you know, the uh, Commission approved the Equity and Inclusion Action Plan that the working group had developed. So we're just here to give you an update on some of the things we're doing, you know, given the uh, early stages of uh, implementing the plan, there still has been some uh, activity there. We just want to let you know what's going on. and provide an opportunity for the commissioners to give us any feedback because this can be a, you know an ongoing process of commissioners giving us uh, suggestions ideas um, anything that you think we as staff should be doing to forward uh, this agenda so um, yeah, as you remember the um, initial action items had to do with uh, one culture two regulatory review three customer service four hiring and retention and five procurement practices, so those five items. So Jill and I will, will, will uh, in, uh, tag team uh, going through those items with you today and some of the things that are going on. Jill's gonna start off um, just talking a little bit about the culture and what, um, act, what actions we've been taking already and some of the planned uh, steps we have for the commission. We'll turn over to Jill, hello. Hello again. Um, you'll remember um, that culture, we focused on training, communications and reporting and celebrating our community and um, we have um, already started um, implementing some of these ideas and and actions um, for example um, human resources launched um, uh, diversity trainings on unconscious bias through linkedin learning um, staff are also um, attending an online preventing workplace harassment uh, training um, in order to ensure that we um, foster a safe and respectful and inclusive environment. And uh, we fully expect that training and, and most of these activities uh, will be ongoing. So we'll continue to report to you on these. Um, in terms of communications and reporting, um, we, we definitely want to um, be transparent about our efforts and um, not only to the commission, but to the staff and to the public. So we will be regularly reporting on our efforts um, and we'll also utilize the um, MGC town halls. Um, so for example, on December 4th, we have planned a special town hall featuring um, guest speaker Robert Lewis Jr who's um, uh, CEO of the BASE, a Boston-based nonprofit um, that provides athletic, education, career-building resources um, to um, youth athletes and encourages them to um, pursue a college degree. And I just want to highlight just a little bit because I'm rather excited about this guest speaker. He's been a leader throughout his life. He grew up in Boston, um, but from um, his, his early career where he founded um, the Boston Astros, a regional baseball team composed of kids growing up in public housing 
to in the mid 1980s when he opened the first black health club in Boston. Um, or his years working for the city when he founded um, uh, um, uh, anti-gang um, violence prevention initiative called Street Safe um, or the Street Worker Program. Later at the Boston Foundation, where he created two standing initiatives, um, Street Safe Boston and Champs Boston, to reduce gun violence. In, uh, in Boston and to promote positive youth development through sports trainings. Um, and more recently, his um, organization called The Base, which really is intended to shift the mindset um, about what it takes for urban Black and Latino youth to succeed. Um, so he utilizes um, the power and passion of baseball and other sports now um, to help student athletes find pathways to success on and off the field. So he's going to be talking to us about his experience um, and life story about growing up as a black man in Boston and will inspire us all, I think, to lead from where we are. So just wanted to, I guess, drum up a little excitement um, <laughs> about that. Uh, Director Griffin, if I could chime in, I was fortunate enough to visit the base with Director Griffin, um, and it was such an imp impressive place. Um, I think young people think they go there to improve their baseball skills, but they end up with so much more. Um, what, one of the things that impressed me so much, so don't miss this lecture is what I'm trying to say, is when we walked in, when a, a young person who may be training, maybe up, maybe up at bat swinging, they stop what they're doing, they come over, they take their hat off, they look you in the eye, they shake your hand. Uh, it was just so impressive. And the other thing uh, I was impressed with is it started off as baseball. And I think some of the girls in, in the local neighborhood said, hey, we, we would love to train with maybe softball. And so we started a whole program there too. So just really an impressive um, individual as well as uh, uh, the program itself. I mean, these kids end up, he, he has, um, he has, and he'll talk about this, but he has contacts to these colleges all through New England, and he just, he just funnels these young people um, to get a college degree, and they do their training for the SATs right there at the base. They do their homework, and uh, just life lessons were just amazing. I actually have not been to such a, an impressive place I can't think of another time that I was that impressed with a program like this. So, uh, Jill, I just want to thank you for taking me there. And secondly, um, I, I really look forward to this event. Commissioner Cameron and I forgot about our tour of Boston early on. Um, so thank you for reminding me. Um, but, and I agree, I'm, I'm excited as well. Um, so to, to move on and a just little bit. Just in terms oh, of the the import of this um, in terms of, it's a real kickoff uh, for the good work that um, will come out of the framework that was developed and adopted by the commission with the, the, the working group. It's an exciting kickoff. We've already had the, the, the internal TED Talks that were wonderful, but I think um, this lecture, if we will call it that, um, will be just such a gift and such inspiration for all of us. So thank you, Jill. Jill's being a little humble um, in that she has known this gentleman for oh, so many years that it, it didn't seem possible. It was over 30 years. And um, I had the chance to meet with him over the phone with Jill. And you could just tell what respect he has for Jill. And, um, and he's delighted to come and speak with us. And I think in many ways, because how much he admires Jill and all that she's accomplished. So um, there's mutual admiration and respect, but um, I thank you for arranging it because it really will be a gift in December for all of us. I think my only regret is that it's, it's an internal thing. Um, and I think anybody who's listening from the outside world would love to be able to hear Mr. Lewis speak. So um, it, thank you so much. Uh, very, very important outreach on your part. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, the respect is, um, you know, extended to him as well. 
Um, and just um, in terms of culture, I'll, um, I'll just say the work is ongoing, but um, um, we are um, talking about um, um, talking with human resources um, and they're talking about launching a newsletter, an internal newsletter um, that will have all kinds of information and be a real vehicle for um, um, information about diversity but also all kinds of um, information um, regarding staff communications. Um, and um, a series of programming um, to be announced later. Um, Director Wells and I um, met with um, uh, HR manager Banda and, and Tanya Perez and um, we had some exciting discussions, but we really want to announce this at a later time. So we'll, we'll keep you posted. Um, um, but it, it does include a, a culture club working group. So we'll say that. And, and I think um, Chair Judd Stein mentioned um, our MGC talks. Um, the first one, which featured um, a discussion on um, diversity and uh, the real intention of these MGC talks is getting to know your coworkers, um, getting to know, um, you know, similarities, differences, and, and just um, to, in this day of um, electronic meetings and um, HD meetings and Zoom calls, um, leveraging um, relationships. And so we hope we did that well. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Director Wells to review the regulatory review. Yes, Karen, so, can I, Karen, can I interrupt before absolutely. you move off from culture? First off, I want to see if anybody has any questions for Jill on culture, because if you remember, it's a five point action plan. Well, I just wanted, I, I had a um, little inspirational uh, language to share because it, it, it really brought home this piece of work. I happened to attend a, a Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce um, webinar this week, and it was interesting. I'd mentioned it to to Karen um, and Trupti because it and, um, it really has to do, perhaps, with moving forward. On, and, and Enrique, I think you were there too um, on our on space and what it might look like when we return to the office to work, whatever that's going to be, and whenever it's going to be. And so the, the, it was addressing space, and the speaker was was just captivating. Her name is Elizabeth Lowry, and she's with Elkis Manfredi Architect. She's an architect, and she started her talk mainly around you know, what what will workspace look like, what will uh, what will we we be when we are no longer just strictly remote. And she said, and this is what I wanted to share. Culture eats strategy for breakfast every day. And so I, I think that you've started with you know, the number one point. If our culture is strong and inclusive and diverse and respectful, the strategy and all of our, our, our requirements and responsibilities will flow from there. So I liked it. Culture eats, uh, eats strategy for breakfast. So thank you. That's um, something I, I may have to put that up on the wall as a reminder. I love it. I love it. Yeah, it, it, and I, you, know, you could see the comments. Uh, it was a pre predominantly uh, female or, um, audience and the comments where everybody was quoting it, like it just it resonated. There were many great quotes, but I, that's for another day, Jill. I can share them with you, but that one I thought you would appreciate. You know, and if I could add to that, and the way to reinforce and strengthen that culture is precisely what I think we're doing and we're doing well and that is to continue to talk about this to, to continue with the momentum of you know the initial energy that uh, that the group started with and coming back and reporting and engaging people and generating another another working group ad hoc as it might need, need to be um, that's that's what I think really drives the culture and doesn't um, 
turn into a flavor of the month type of exercise. This is too important to be uh, perceived or, or, or forgotten eventually uh, as just, you know, a sign of, of, of a passing time. So um, it's important to keep the commitment and, and, I, and I think uh, it's important to recognize that we will continue to do that as we have been doing. Absolutely. Karen? Okay, so, uh, and more on the ops side, less on the fund side, the uh, regulatory review, uh, you know, that's a long-term project, as you said, in, as you said in the uh, action plan, it would be something, uh, the regulatory review that the commission would do every three years, there would be items uh, that we would fold into that process to address issues of equity and inclusion. So I'll be working with uh, Commissioner Zuniga uh, to pull that into that review process. Um, those two items were that the regulation does not result in a disproportionate negative impact and uh, it eliminates barriers to opportunities for individuals and or communities of color. So we have obtained some guidance uh, from within other, uh, others in state government on some best practices. So I'm looking forward to the project, but that is a more long-term project and more ops project on uh, the volume of regulations that we do have. So I don't know if uh, any questions have any questions or thoughts on that because we are going to start that process relatively soon. So if there any comments or questions, please just let me know. Well, if, if I may, I just uh, add a little bit uh, from what you already uh, mentioned, Karen. We have a, a good template of an approach uh, facilitated by, by Chair Stein, Judge Stein that from the from the state, um, there's, there's um, uh, things that we will be incorporating relative to a checklist and plan and a form to do a lot of these on a rolling basis is, is the best way to kind of think about it, uh, given, you know, that we have a lot of other commitments as well. Um, and we'll come back and that enhance, you know, the long term nature. Uh, but uh, the way to do it is start with, you know, a group a set of regulations and, and go from there. I think then, and of course, for this discussion, it's that lens of as we as as we consider regulations right now that come before us, we should always make sure to have this particular lens uh, on our on our on our minds and, and and think about the impact that inadvertently a regulation could have with respect to uh, people and communities of color. So, the very I think we've already had some examples of it. So it's uh, it's purposeful and intentional review. Right, right. Thanks. So the, uh, so the third item sort of ties in on sort of that op side of the house, uh, uh, that is the customer service. And that's sort of a focus on our policies, procedures, practices, really looking for fair and equitable outcomes um, and it, granting accessibility to advance economic prosperity for individuals and communities of color. So. You know, this action item uh, requires a sort of agency-wide approach. You know, we've got, you know, everyone from, uh, you know, our community affairs team to licensing to legal to research. We touch a lot of uh, people and communities you know, throughout our organization. Uh, so the plan is for each division in the agency to submit some recommendations to the executive director, to me, on how they can measure success in this area. For example, in responsiveness or completeness in terms of information. So uh, this is an ongoing uh, uh, evaluation of how we do business uh, and having, and it, it ties in with what we were talking about earlier and culture. So what is our culture and how do we treat people and what, um, what is our approach with respect to um, so our outward facing uh, components within our organization. Um, so this concept, you know, should be woven through uh, discussions at various meetings at various different levels within the agency. So um, this is another ongoing long term project. Um, uh, any feedback, particularly on this item uh, from the commissioners would be most welcome. Um, now, you know, in today's discussion or going forward. You know, if there's any uh, interesting models or things we should look at with how other either state agencies, private enterprises um, are, are looking at uh, making uh, this accessibility a reality, uh, we would be interested in that. Um, but again, the focus is on our culture and communication, not only within ourselves, but also externally. 
you know, a good example, you know, I was just listening to Joe Delaney this morning talking about these workshops for, uh, for people that may be applying for grants. That's a forward-facing great opportunity, uh, you know, to advance uh, opportunities within communities of color and give the sort of some feedback on how to apply for grants. So I just thought this morning that tied in great uh, in, in what we're doing uh, with the equity and inclusion group. So, you know, commending Joe and his team for that. Um, so that, that's an, a, an open discussion. So welcome any feedback or any comments on what you'd like staff to be doing in that area. Um, Question, Commissioner? Director Wells, it reminds me of when the five of us sat in a room and figured out, started to figure out what we should do, and Commissioner Zuniga and Stebbins will remember this. Um, you know, we put together some guiding principles, and this was one that we talked about extensively. So, and how important it was that we were, um, our customer service was top shelf. But I think there's a difference between writing it in a document and actually making sure all parts of our agency are doing it. So I just, I just commend you for understanding how important this is and, and getting all of our, our divisions involved and how they can just kind of check to make sure they're doing the best they possibly can with this. It's critical to the organization. So when I read this, I thought, wow, this, is, this goes back to the very beginning, but it needs to be revisited and it needs mm -hmm. to be um, something you actually think about, talk about, involve people and not just put it on the wall somewhere, right? Right, right. Yeah, that's great. You Appreciate know, and just maybe maybe to add a little bit, um, it's easier just internally for our, for our different uh, departments and divisions, it's perhaps easier to think that some have more customer service than others. I can think of maybe licensing or investigations, but the reality is that everybody has a customer, an internal or external customer, uh, either our peers, the people you know, uh, that, we, that we finance, the, the bills that we pay, uh, uh, the budgets that we review, everybody in our organization has a, has a customer and or mul multiple customers in some ways. And uh, with this principle, um, it's incumbent upon everybody to, to think um, what I'm doing is serving a customer and I should be thinking in those terms when I send my email, when I use you know, um, the, the, the mechanisms that I'm gonna use and in my daily work, et cetera. So looking forward to, I know it's too, a little abstract perhaps, but, um, but looking forward to making sure that that continues to be a change of, um, or you know, a reinforcement of a culture of customer service. Yeah, Karen, I would I would just add to that. Um, you know, the great comments by Commissioner Zuniga on the on the customer facing piece, and we know we do have departments that have more interaction with with um, the public, and it's great. You know, a simple suggestion would be, you know, reach out to them after they've interacted with us. What was their experience like? It can be a quick survey monkey. It can talk about, we'll not only get feedback as to how we treated that individual or that s small business, but they may yeah. also give us some thoughts and ideas on how we can improve our process. And you know, this kind of constant relooking at how we do things and, and, yeah. and, and strive for, you know, efficiencies. but. You know, it can be something as simple as we interacted with you. What was your experience like? How were you treated? Um, it can be a quick, simple, you know, survey monkey that gives us some immediate feedback as to uh, as to how we're treating the public, which is important. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, so, and, and of course, uh, but yeah. the expertise of Jill again through this lens, and and you know we. We are, have our secret weapon in Jill, not so secret anymore, yeah. but to, <laughs> to, to remind us of, um, of, of making sure we have that, that intentional lens of looking that somehow inadvertently we aren't either promoting opportunities in a way that we could or somehow disadvantaging. So uh, I love, Karen, that you, already you're taking the step of, of, of communicating this message across the divisions, you know, how it gets implemented, it's a big project, but, you know, there are going to be incremental, there's going to be incremental progress just by communicating it. 
and just keeping it on your regular monthly right. check-in and right. and and asking folks to report hey this is what i did you know I, I mean this is what we did we came up with this idea because it will be replicated in different ways throughout yeah. the, throughout the organization thank okay. you Ma madam chair i'd add that our secret weapon jill griffin has also developed an extensive set of contacts with chambers of commerce and businesses who have all wrestled with this question about customer service and getting feedback and you know bringing a, a group together that we've worked with to just kind of share what their experience has been i think would be would be a helpful that's a great idea also. great idea okay excellent all right so yeah, i really and i do appreciate the feedback and please feel free you know email me uh come chat with me anytime you know either staff or commissioners because i'm really interested in suggestions and ideas on that because it is interwoven with everything we do. Um, and so the next uh, the next action item has to do with hiring and retention. Uh, so Jill will be supporting HR on their ongoing efforts in this area. That this is as in, uh, Commissioner Cameron mentioned, you know, the diversity and promotion of diversity had been something that uh, original five commissioners had noted is something important within the agency, and uh, we've been working on that uh, since the beginning. Uh, but adding Jill to the mix, as you said, the secret weapon and getting some additional resources to help out in that area, I think is uh, only going to help us. Um, we've now established a practice of including her in the hiring process for all our new employees, which is great. And she really adds a, a nice touch um, to, the, to the process and giving us uh, helpful information and insights. And we really have enjoyed having her in, in that process personally. And so our goal is um, to increase diversity in our applicant pools. So uh, yeah, I'll turn it over to Jill just to talk a little bit about um, specifics on you know, what her um, suggestions have been, um, where we're advertising, some ways that we've been looking to sort of increase our outreach in that area. Um, so um, it's been my pleasure to work with the um, human resources team and um, even before outreach, um, I think you all heard um, uh, human, human resource manager, um, Trupti Banda, talk about um, job descriptions and um, how important it is to really look at the job description and, um, you know, is it written for what you really need? Um, you know, what is required for the job? Um, and, when a job description is written so that it is inclusive, it allows for a wider range of um, different people to more easily see themselves in the position um, and decide to apply. So that helps with the applicant pool. On the flip side, um, job descriptions that are not inclusive may limit candidates' um, interest and make it harder to find a diverse um, candidate pool. Um, so that's one of the areas that from the very beginning, um, human resources um, pushes the hiring manager to think about, is that really what you need um, or a requirement of the job? So I think that's important to start with. Um, and, and I have um, worked with a team on outreach and recruitment and um, really um, focusing on um, some grassroots or um, community-based outreach. Um, yeah, um, there's an organization called Get Connected, uh, which is a public relations firm that focuses on connecting um, people of diverse backgrounds, just everyone, right? Um, they put out information like the, um, the top lawyers of color, that sort of thing, um, you know, and they focus on various industries. Um, you know, um, Sarah uh, was helpful in connecting actually us to the dinner group, which is a group of um, 1,500 black men who meet, um, professional men who meet um, really to connect um, with each other. And members range from very senior level um, 
established professionals um, to those who are just entering or beginning their careers. Um, so that's the range of kind of community um, outreach. Um, we've also, um, for example, um, for all three of the positions that we currently have posted, um, the Boston Bar Association has diversity affinity groups. And um, for a very small fee, you can um, post the position with the Boston Bar, but also with the um, Black lawyers, the Hispanic lawyers, the Asian American affinity group. Um, so, so we've done that for these um, positions. And um, um, we've really utilized um, our internal, um, and I want to call out um, Austin and Sarah on this, our so MGC social media. So um, as always, we um, um, send out tweets and Facebook um, posts, um, but we are tagging various organizations um, so that people um, see those posts. Um, we had um, some suggestions at one of the previous meetings and have posted with the International Association of the Chiefs of Police um, and the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Officers. Thank you, Commissioner Cameron. Um, so those, uh, that's kind of um, at a high level. Um, so we are um, continuing those efforts and um, uh, that's it in a nutshell. So um, we will also, um, part of this is um, our licensees um, recruitment efforts. And so we will also continue to publicly monitor and prioritize the licensees hiring, as you know um, that we have, you get quarterly reports um, on those practices and with respect to their commitment. And you can see that, um, um, has continued even through these tri uh, trying times. Um, and then um, things in the future, um, mentoring, development, and retention efforts. So we look forward to working on those. So I'll pause at that point. Any comments or questions for Jill? Okay. So the, and then the, the fifth action item is, is very similar. It's the procurement practices to re-examine, re-evaluate uh, policies, procedures, and practices to maximize the MGCs and licensees, minority-owned business spend. Um, you know, we've been doing that. Jill's been tracking that on the licensee side. Um, you know, our legal department is uh, commencing just as a normal uh, course of business, a, a complete review of our procurement procedures. We do have uh, a lot of expertise in our office through our finance team uh, on our procurement procedures generally. But in a review of that, well, we're going to be holding in Jill so that um, when we're looking at those processes and procedures, um, our efforts uh, and diversity spend are included in that evaluation. So, um, you know, Jill, I'll turn it over to you just to talk about, you know, some of the communications you've been having at HAT, having with, uh, internally with uh, other members of our staff and, and externally as well. Um, <clears throat> well, I started with the experts. At, um, my first meeting with it was with CFAO Lennon and Agnes, who I see on uh, who's on the call, um, and I really picked their brains about um, what the opportunities were, and um, you know maybe some of their struggles and and how I could support um, the finance team generally, um, and. Um, then I've started meeting individually with directors. Um, so I've, uh, you know, really to get an idea of um, the opportunities in each of the shops um, and, and that will continue. Um, and, and really what some of the challenges might be in terms of um, procurement with an MBE um, or even other diverse spend. Um, and then yesterday, um, we had an incredible meeting with um, um, the state's supplier diversity office with um, Bill McAvoy. And really, I think it was 
almost his entire team. Um, and that's exciting because um, the governor has um, um, recently issued an announcement that um, the supplier diversity office potentially will be its own secretariat, will have a lot more um, focus and, and outward attention um, in terms of um, outreach. They've recently hired um, um, Rob Williams, who's director of diverse and small business engagement. Um, and his job is just that. Um, the um, Commonwealth Supplier Diversity Office and, and Bill, uh, Director Bill McElroy have um, committed to working with us um, to look at our spend uh, or our projected spend six months out um, and um, working to recruit or inform um, diverse businesses about those opportunities. So I think that is really, really valuable. And they were really excited to partner with us. So, so that was um, yesterday's meeting was just the beginning. Um, but we've already talked about um, subsequent meetings. Questions and for Jill on, on the diverse spend. I'm so pleased that you met with that group. Um, it's a very innovative team. I know that you've worked with them in the past, and I know that they'll be very interested in supporting your efforts here, Jill. So, Thank you. Any other questions? Just, just a Anything compliment. Yes. Very impressive report. Uh, congratulations to the whole working group and Jill. Great work and what added value. Um, it's really, it's really, um, it's nice to see. And and Karen, again, thank you also for putting in the, the materials um, that are part of our packet, uh, the statement of purpose that the working group developed. Um, it's a good, straightforward uh, roadmap and one that we put you in charge of. So, yes. <laughs> Enrique, that was good thinking. Yeah. Um, so we, we, um, we thank you for, for leading that effort. And I think I know that Enrique, Commissioner Zuniga expressed, you know, the, the goal is to keep um, our attention here. I don't think um, we have one worry uh, with this team on our watch, right? Um, uh, Executive Director Wells and, and uh, Director Griffin. I think the intention is there and we understand it needs to be a continuing responsibility on everyone's part. Uh, so exciting. I think I uh, shared Commissioner Cameron's sentiment. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. And thank you to the whole team that's been working on this. Yeah, excellent. So that, that, that concludes that, that agenda item and we will keep you posted as part of the plan. You will be getting regular updates from the, the working group and there'll be uh, uh, giving you more information as we go forward. Thank you. And, and I didn't mean to cut off if you anybody else wanted to say something. Commissioner Stubbins, O'Brien. No, great work, everybody. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. So um, we're on to, uh, I guess it's under commissioner updates, uh, Commissioner Zuniga, uh, with respect to the draft uh, annual report. Yes. I'll, um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, included in the packet is the, the draft of the annual report. Um, I wanted to take a few minutes and, and, and speak a little bit about a couple of highlights um, that, um, that I think is incumbent upon us to, to talk about. Of course, it be, it's being presented as, as a draft so that if any commissioners want to change, edit, update, uh, you know, delete or expound on anything. Um, we, we are at a, at a good time frame to, to still do it. Uh, in the past, we've, we've ended up submitting the report closer to December. Um, I think it's in a good working order at this point with a lot of work that came from a lot of people who's, um, who are the directors of certain sections, uh, so certain uh, divisions and hence have a different section. Um, but there's still time as we go into production with, um, you know, with some uh, nice graphs to edit it if we, if we needed to. So uh, I'll mention a couple of things. Um, 
we, for the most part, are following the same format uh, of the same sections that we've had in the past. Um, and uh, of course, this is a very different, a very unique uh, year. Um, there are, as you may have noticed, um, a couple of comparisons to a prior year um, where, it, where we felt it was necessary to put into context. Um, but there could be, uh, um, you know, again, more if, if people felt that um, it was it was necessary. Um, I I will note uh, a couple of those areas. Uh, first, uh, first thing that comes to mind. This was a very different year, just in terms of um, a lot of the disbursements that happened that come from from casino uh, revenues because there was three months of closure um, of suspension of operations. So, uh, for example, in racing, uh, the disbursements this year were almost half out of the race horse development fund, were almost half of what they were a year ago. And a couple of things happened there. Uh, there was live racing uh, that was uh, that ended uh, prior to the beginning of this fiscal year. In other words, June 30th of 2019. So there is no disbursements effectively for live racing for thoroughbred during this last fiscal year. In addition to that, there was uh, three months of um, and no funding into the Racehorse Development Fund um, since March, which was then, uh, um, you know, by the, the finance team reacted accordingly and made disbursements, made no disbursements uh, as, a, as a result of them. There was a decrease in the number of days at the Plain Ridge uh, because, you know, uh, they were uh, uh, closed. So we have a, a year that looks like half of the prior disbursements um, from, uh, from about close to 15 million to about 7 million um, in terms of um, total disbursement. Um, diversity uh, has gone up, uh, by the way, and there's a comparison um, in, the, in the chart there um, from 17% to 21%, but of course we have had a a high mark of 25% of our own diversity um, at, at, at our own uh, agency. But I know uh, because of all, everything that we've talked about, there's um, uh, increased efforts to try to uh, trend that number up with the, with the current uh, vacancies that we have, even though they're not that many. Um, we, um, we are silent currently on, on the diversity and inclusion working group, um, but we don't have to. And let me just mention a couple, of, um, a couple of data points. The working group met, I believe for the first time, even though we talked a little bit about it, uh, met for the first time uh, in late June. The statement of purpose uh, was issued well into this now fiscal year, and we, there's a lot of work that that carries. Um, so for that reason, mostly, um, we are not talking currently about the working group, but we could put it, uh, uh, we could put any, uh, a paragraph or a summary of the statement of purpose or whatever the, the commissioners felt uh, was appropriate. Um, there's usually, a, there's, there's a section that we have about major milestones anticipated for the next fiscal year. And that in the past, that was in this year, we usually talk about so, um, you know, any developments that, that have already begun to happen effectively um, for this topic. Um, there's, there's of course a lot of different inter difference in terms of revenues uh, and we do provide uh, some um, context for, for the decrease in revenues. Um, a lot of that, for example, did not really affect the community mitigation uh, section. Um, it looks very similar to last year um, because there was enough funding and the, the funding cycle of that whole program is not necessarily you know, um, pegged to the actual revenues that come month to month. There's more of a planning year that happens. Um, 
So anyway, those, those uh, were the highlights I wanted to um, introduce. Um, I can pause there and take any comments or questions. Commissioner Cameron Zuniga? May I start, please? Thank you. Commissioner Cameron, uh, first yes. of all, thank you. I, um, first of all, I, I, every year I say this, but I know how much work this is. So I want to commend you for the work you've put in year after year and the team that works with you to get this done. Um, you know, as I was reading it last night, I, um, when, first of all, I came up to the, the section on recommendations, legal action, uh, legislative action, and it, it just wants, did you want to say a recommended uh, legislative action? I just it didn't it didn't flow right to me, so I just recommendations legislative action. That was just something that caught my eye. Maybe yeah, actually, yeah, that that that's improper language. It's it's for or it, it, we need to correct that uh, title. Okay, and then, then and then in reading that section, I was looking at the horse racing piece, and I, I understand that we're supposed to really outline um, things that happened this year, and it made me think. I don't know that this present commission has really talked about that matter, meaning um, um, expiring nature of the, of the of the horse racing statutes in a permanent manner. And I just wondered if we're just carrying it over, or if we before doing that, if we should just decide if that's still um, something this commission uh, thinks is relevant. It just, it made me think that, um, I don't think we've talked about this as a commission this year at all. Um, and I just wondered if, if that was something we should address. That, yet yeah, I think you're right in terms of having talked about it this uh, year or not, not having talked about it. Um, we have in the past, and this section has grown over the years. We've, we've submitted a section, you know, this, this topic in this section uh, pretty much uh, every year since 2016. And you'll notice in the middle of that, um, uh, that section how the, the chapters from 2015, 2016, 17, 18, Right, 19, I do see that, yeah, and I just- We've yeah. added, you know, that's the part that we've added because the legislature has, well, added right. every year has added a new chapter uh, in terms of um, I see. addressing these one year at a time. Um, and, you know, we, yeah, no, I just, we, I just we, wondered we if this is, yeah, and the other question I had is, um, um, I know that we've submitted reports and we were required to do that with recommendations. But I, I just didn't know, and it just struck me when I read this, uh, however, in our opinion, I, I just wondered if the annual report was the right place to express a commission. I guess when I read that, that's when I thought, wow, I wonder if all five commissioners feel like this is appropriate because this is a different group of commissioners. And secondly, I just wondered, it's a process question, um, should we be, ex you know, talking about opinions in a um, in an inter annual report? Just those two questions. That's all. Yeah, very relevant. Thanks for highlighting them. Um, you are correct from the beginning of your remarks that this has been uh, a bit of a carryover. The same recommendations, effectively, with with the slight update of the of the chapters that have happened. Um, you know, every every year effectively. Um, I happen to think, and, and whether we word it as in our opinion or not, but I do happen to think, and here's the, you know, this is a mechanism to express our opinion, this public meeting, that, um, that the horse racing industry would be better off with longer term, with more certainty. And um, the, um, the nature of their extensions, um, I believe, um, doesn't quite um, help much when, when we know that there are other mechanisms that the legislature itself put in place to help the industry in the racehorse development fund. If, um, and we've talked I, about- I happen and to seen, agree with you. I absolutely agree with you, but I, my question was just, is this, is this the appropriate way to express our opinion? I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, well, that's a that's a very valid question. Uh, I happen to believe that it's um, it's you know it's a, a, a an appropriate place. 
um, there could be alternatives. I happen to believe that um, um, perhaps not everybody in the legislature is reading this annual report, sadly, and I think they should. Um, so, you know, where we can, where we can inform, um, you know, uh, if we can do it in multiple ways, um, talking about it in meetings, um, putting more statements, position statements, um, or frankly, deferring to others to do that uh, communication, you know, it's really, it's really up to the five of us. I, I, I believe that um, there's, a, it, there's a mandate as regulators of racing, same that, that, that is very, very much in parallel from, uh, from gaming, of um, trying to ensure uh, the viability and sustainability of, of, of those two industries. And that's, um, that's why I think it's, um, it's appropriate to, uh, to express it as, as, you know, as taking a position. Mm -hmm. but, but again, happy to take it out if, uh, if a majority of my colleagues believe that it's inappropriate to talk about it in the, in the annual report. <laughs> And if I, I, you know, I, Commissioner O'Brien, I, I do. This this came up in another conversation that I was having um, with Todd and Kathy and Karen um, about how we want to go forward in terms of legislative recommendations and actions. Because it, to Gail's point, you know, some of us were not here when some of these earlier recommendations went out. Um, and in terms of an annual report, I think it is a proper topic, but probably better restricted to what was actually done in the past year. I, and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm looking at some of these in the recommendations for legislative action. And it's a, to your point, it's a carryover and not uh, date specific in terms of what did we specifically do in the last fiscal year or calendar year. So I think a way of addressing what Gail talked about and, and some of the issues that we talked about in the other meeting was maybe restricting the references in the annual report to uh, really what was time specific for this, for the scope of this report, uh, because then it is in there, to your point, it's something we are mandated to look at in terms of horse racing in particular, but I do think that it's more accurate in terms of, um, you know, what, what was in front of us last year. Do you think that applies to um, that? That certainly might apply to number two, the the expiring nature, the evolving nature of online gaming, perhaps. But you know, even though there's been a lot of evolution uh, elsewhere, not here. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I do. We, my memory is that we did specifically vote to send a letter to the legislature on the expiration of the force, ra you know, on horse racing, and that we asked them to right. take a more holistic approach. I think there is something relevant to that within this time period also? Yes, I agree. I agree that um, with respect to number one, I think you start, I don't have the document right in front of me, Enrique, but I think that you start with the reference of, of the deadline. Um, and so I think that for a uh, uh, report on the fiscal year activities, that would be appropriate, that that in fact we did act on. Um, I have the same concerns with this, this section because I would say that History is always important um, if it remains relevant. Um, if it's no longer accurately reflecting um, our, our priorities, our policy, our thinking, our opinion, um, then I don't think it should be included. I think it needs to be accurate, but history is relevant, but I don't think you just you know, roll it over. Um, I have, so I'm, I'm looking at num that page uh, with a, a little bit of a different lens and that I, I think that we also have Todd is is going to provide an update on the status of all legislative filings, legislative activity um, that we have done in the past and where we are. But I think the fiscal the this report, the annual report, I think Gail mentioned that it should maybe be focused, and, and Eileen was also referencing that it should be focused on what actually was done during this fiscal year. I I don't believe I've ever um, had the uh, matters come before me where we've talked about online gaming. And that's in number two, and it suggests our opinion. And I can say it may reflect the, the opinion of the commission, you know, at one point in time, but I think um, it, it, I liken it to if we talked about, uh, if we talked about this device in 2017, um, the evolutions of this device in, in three years, this has changed so much. And 
online gaming has changed so much and we haven't expressed an opinion i wouldn't want the legislature to pick this document up and and see that it's our opinion um, on something as complex as online gaming and have it not be actually something that we acted on during this this period of time i don't know if, commissioner um, o'brien if you wanted to add in because i might have cut you off i'm sorry no i think it's accurate there's also the other reason obviously that um based on the timing of the legislative session, it, it may be that that recommendation is also no longer sort of a live issue. So I think if we stick to what was our action within the last year for the report, uh, I do think it satisfies flagging what our positions were, but then it's also consistent with um, sort of the, the time, the time restriction on the annual. Well, and it prompted me to think, you know, these are really important issues and maybe this, this commission needs to talk about them and maybe come up with some fresh ideas about how we can move forward with this. That was my original thought was, you know, uh, just maybe it's time to revisit these. They're important enough to put in the annual report. I think it's important enough for us to discuss as a commission and make sure we're in agreement A and B. Um, you know, I, I think things have changed in the last couple of years. And maybe we want to incorporate some of that. And I think so what Todd is working on yeah. going back, um, and, and actually now that I see this, you know, we were figuring out how to get the best record of what exactly we did. The annual obviously is a great jumping off point then, so that they can give the overview. Some of this may no longer be relevant, some is fine to repeat, maybe some needs to be tweaked, uh, but it is something that um, I know Todd is, and his group is working on so we can all get a refresher on what's out there. That's 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 fine. I, I seem to be here uh, um, hearing um, at least for now to eliminate number two from that legislative action. And, and number one also, I I wouldn't say it's eliminating. I think we have to re review all of this carefully. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. uh, because I think number one states our opinion, and again, I think that's with respect to the filing that's been done in the past, which you know, I think may reflect the opinion of the commission in the past, but we haven't really looked at where it, horse racing is right now to, to really know if our filing would shift. And that's why I asked Todd for that update because it may be that we don't shift, so don't presume anything. It's just that we haven't really reflected on that filing in any kind of a substantive fashion. And, you know, I want all the input from Dr. Lightbound and, and Commissioner Cameron and, and and the committee, if need be, on, on our filing. So I wonder uh, if I, it, I, the, yeah. the entry um, phrase that says, in accordance with General Law Chapter 30, Section 30, and General Law Chapter 23K, and then we submit recommendations for legislative action, it probably just needs to be, you know, over the past fiscal year, you know, topics upon which this commission, you know, submitted recommendations mm -hmm. or recommendations requests to the legislature included, and then you go through and just make sure what's bulleted here is in fact, and Enrique, even if you maybe, if, you, if you're feeling like you'd want people to know the historical topics, I think a broader reference would be in that opening paragraph. You know, if it even said historically, these are the areas that the commission has um, submitted comments or communications to the legislature, and then say specifically this past year, and more pointed with these paragraphs because then i think i can hear you Rinka, that you're a little hesitant to sort of cut excise them all together um for reference but maybe yeah section. You know, I, I think that's a good that's a good suggestion uh, mm -hmm. and i am a little reluctant from for a couple of things there are a couple of reasons let me just take one at a time or let me stay with with racing the statute mandates that the commission submit a draft uh 128d which, which we did, you know, a long time ago. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, the, and, 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 the, and the legislature hasn't acted on. It. And I think a lot of what we did discuss, and granted, at least two of you were not there for those initial discussions. And maybe we really need to go back, go back and, and have those discussions. But, but I happen to believe that they are still very much valid, that, that the statute expired, and, and, and we submitted what was, I believe, a really good um, 
researched, a lot of research went into best practices from around the country as to how a racing could be, um, um, you know, modified, the, 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 the simulcasting and live racing statutes. Um, so um, the other thing is, and I'm glad you highlighted the, the reference, we are, re we are required, invited to submit recommendations for legislative action um, in, as per the statute. And um, uh, although I, I, I actually happen, if I remember correctly, that requirement is only once every two years. We have done it, uh, you know, every year because you know it's not limited to every two years. But 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 if I remember correctly, the actual language is that we submit recommendations for legislative action every two years. And so um, I would not be and have not been shy about um, expressing our opinion. For sure, we need to be. Um, all in agreement that it's at least a majority of us who believe this is our opinion and it still applies and it's still uh, relevant because it happened in in um, in last year or not or no longer relevant. Um, but you know, again, um, I think um, the, the 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 online gaming back to a, a, another another topic has has even evolved even more to what I think is embedded in this uh, recommendation. Again, it's my opinion, it may not be that of everybody. Um, but what we've seen around the country is a, a, a move uh, towards, uh, you know, online, online, uh, everything online. Yeah. But Commissioner oh, Zuniga, can I interrupt? Open. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Commissioner O'Brien. Before I, we so get into this. Yeah, yeah like it, so I think what we really need to do, and, and please let me know if this is not the consensus we're, we seem to be reaching, which is rewriting that introductory phrase to maybe be even a short paragraph that talks about the fact that we are invited, you know, at least every two years or, you know, as necessary to give it the opinion on things. Since its inception, the commission has commented on the following areas, et cetera, so that it's out there for context. And then we really limit the detail below to what was done in the last year. And I think that addresses what you're talking about, Enrique, but then also what we're talking mm -hmm. about in terms of restricting it to the present. I, I think that makes a lot of sense, because I do agree with you, Enrique, that the historical piece is important, and it's beating the drum. We still think this is important, but, uh, but I, that, that format seems to be a better way to do it. And I think it's important to say maybe the date of when yeah. that was expressed, because then, yeah. in fact, I, I haven't had a chance to express my views or my opinion on the filing. And I might be able to persuade you if I think differently. I'm not saying I do, but, there, you know, I just haven't. And so for the word, our opinion, it's just, you know, if we haven't talked about it, it's a little bit, it's difficult to accept, even though I may be entirely in agreement. It's just without really fleshing out these complex topics, I can't say I you know, could sign off on it. And I wouldn't want to be necessarily an obstructionist, but I just wouldn't be able to say, oh yeah, that's my opinion, that's all. Well, I would, I would whether, whether it's now or at a later meeting, uh, uh, of course, you know, time is now for to issue the iron report. It's, 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 it can be rewritten. I, I, yeah, I, I think we just I'd say out. let's have those discussions. Let's have we, those opinions. And let's well, let me, well, I well, I think for purposes of this document, though, I just think we rewrite the opening one and stick to this year. And then yeah. I, I, we, we did already have a conversation with Todd and his group about having that detailed conversation about what's been done in the past so that we can determine as a commission now what needs to be, you know, discussed again. And okay. do we want to mm -hmm. do any yeah. action? And, and Commissioner Stebbins, you're leaning in? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I've been listening to the good back and forth, and, and, uh, and first what struck me was um, the language around the, the, the kind of looking back with respect to the racing statutes, um, and obviously we can't forget our friends on the thoroughbred, but I think you could accurate, accurately portray that it doesn't necessarily have to be our opinion. We have heard from numerous stakeholders over the last year that there needs to be certainty with the racing statutes and I think that's I would feel comfortable being that being language we could fold into at least looking at that legislative review without necessarily expressing an opinion um, to the other points that have been made you know this review that Todd is doing I think gives us an incredible opportunity 
at this two-year cycle, right? End of a legislative session, coming into a new legislative session with a new group of legislators to think about those proposals. And you know, even if it's updating ones that we've suggested before, I think now is the time to to do that as they get ready to return to session in January. And you know, I, I would put racing the racing statute right at the top of that list with some other priorities. But um, I think to Commissioner O'Brien's point, looking at that previous year, but I still think we can say, we heard from the racing industry that there needs to be some consistency and some expectations around the racing bill. And that's a fact, we did hear that throughout the year. Absolutely, so, actually, you know, it is because we have heard <laughs> from yes. them that, that, that I forged my opinion. Um, and we've written this this way, but we, but we don't have to, and 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 we can simply reference um, their their um, advocacy or or comments in the past. Todd, can you give us um, a date of when you expect to be able to update us on? I know it's on our agenda setting um, meeting schedule. I had uh, certainly hoped to be able to do it at your next meeting, and that is my goal. Uh, I'm trying to just pull together all of the historic uh, letters and filings we've made to make sure you have an accurate picture, but at a minimum, I think I can comfortably, at least on a high level, outline the issues and that uh, have been touched upon in the past and what's still a live issue. Thanks. And, so. and I, I would just suggest if it helps, Todd, and you need to break it up into, you know, a couple of meetings to give us a chance to focus on a handful of pieces of legislation at a time, that I'd be comfortable with that, too. Right. And I would ask that um, in terms of if we are going to focus on horse racing, that bill, uh, I'll need some time to review the bill, um, the, the legislation that's been filed. I have I have more understanding. It's not, horse racing is complicated and that the statute is complicated. I have more understanding than I certainly did last year, but I will need some time to think about it. You know, with respect to today's report, Enrique, um, first I wanna thank all the team, that um, every director that submitted their work. I know you did it um, efficiently through SharePoint. Um, this is our first opportunity to look at this because of the open meeting law restrictions. And of course, um, you know, I, I have to admit that it was, um, for me, uh, I read the materials last night, late into the, really into the morning hours, and this was, was part of it. Um, I, I need some more time to go through the document, so I know I'm hearing a deadline. I think I'm hearing we're going to get some updates from Todd, at least, with respect to legislative initiatives, so um, you know, maybe that will help um, uh, on this piece. I, 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 my one suggestion would be with respect to rolling over matters again. Um, I don't, I, I don't want um, there to be a habit of just rolling over something because it's being rolled over. We want to make sure it's accurate always. Um, but I don't think I saw anything that was historically um, like inaccurate, but just because you know life changes except for on this page, but I will want to review the document, you know, carefully. I know, Karen, I don't think you've had a full opportunity to re review it, and I do want the executive director's input, too, on the annual report. Um, yeah. I think, you know, Enrique, so I want to just get back to your timing, and, you know, obviously this page caught our attention, um, and, I, and I want to hear if there's any other edits that we're thinking of. We just happened to jump on Gail's um, initial comments, but I'm, I'm wondering about your timing, um, Enrique. Because you know, I don't want I don't want to uh, hinder um, your timing. The most important is that we we get the content right, so that should drive it. Uh, okay. I, I think in the past, but you know, um, the past should not dictate <laughs> as as clearly evidenced by this discussion. It informs. It in informs. the past, yeah, in the past, we have tried to send the. the the, the report prior to the end of the calendar year, when you know, and around when people are still around, uh, you know, mid December, they can get uh, you know uh, something. Uh, you know, early January at the very latest. But I don't know that that ever really happened. And so we also need um, some time to um, 
to go into production with our consultant with our um, designer a graphic um, um, consultant Jack Rabbit we usually take um, a review at this juncture when they have they want to they want to start reviewing um, for, for style and uniformity and things like that once all the content has been has been done which is where we find ourselves okay so uh, and 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 they're really good they've done it before so they can turn around things quickly maybe a couple of weeks to get new graphics new pictures uh, and produce the, the report that you have seen in the past so there's still i think time to edit um you know um if it's not substantial um in other words but rather even if it's substantial if we do it you know in in you know within a week or two or let's say you know for the next meeting um and uh, and so you know i'd be interested in if you know there was good good suggestions from commissioner o'brien as to kind of like how to address this section that might be mm -hmm. a consensus especially these uh, legislative um recommendations for legislative actions one option by the way if, if, if all of you uh, are, are, are feeling this way. We can simply take it out altogether uh, because we are required, and we'll, we'll just have to verify whether that two-year requirement, you know, for some reason applies to this year, and we did it what we did no, I mean, last I, year, I, or something I like that. A, I think it's a valid topic for the annual. I just think it needs to be more tailored to the right. time. And by the way, can Who I just say? I don't know. I uh, maybe you meant this this way or not, uh, um, Kathy. But I don't think that even in the legislative recommendations there's inaccuracies. It is probably uh, the case that they are a little stale. Um, but uh, but I think what we what we reflect here is, you know, is accurate. Well, um, I um, I'm only looking at number two because I've been working on that topic, and yeah. I wouldn't say that that what's written there reflects our, the position that the team has been taken. And if, if that hasn't been conveyed properly to the whole team, see, I wasn't sure where that came from. I, it concerned me to Karen, are we communicating enough on, on, on that particular topic to the whole team to, to make sure we're all in sync? Because that, that just happened to be, um, it, it didn't seem consistent with the the actually the public position we've been taken right. Right. so that's all so that's what that's no, no, that but, being inaccurate but, but it's not yeah, inaccurate okay. so much on the facts or anything like that it's just we want to make sure we're all in sync um and but right. i'm hearing by the, the way if, this if, this okay. this this section references a report that that that, that was issued as as per the reference in july 2017 which okay. we did collaborate and was before your time and, 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 you know, again, if, if we think it's not relevant anymore, um, I, I happen to believe that it's still relevant. Um, that special commission that the legislature created did issue a report, uh, which we did collaborate with. Um, we were not part of that commission, but we were, you know, we did a lot of work to inform it. Um, so I'm hearing that in terms of getting, um, edits and, and reviews and, and making sure Executive Director Wells has a chance to um, weigh in that if we were to, we could even convene a, a special meeting on this if we needed to, to accelerate our review, but within a week to 10 days or up to even two weeks, which would be December 3rd meeting, um, that wouldn't create a big ob obstacle for you in terms of getting to your timeline. Is one week a whole lot better than two weeks, or? Percent? Well, one yeah, one week is better than two, but it's not at the end of the world if we end up convening until um, until December third. So, um, I'd like to get a sense um, as to whether there might be other sections that we need yeah, to we, sort of. Yeah, I was just going to turn to that too, but I'm just thinking yeah. about at least, um, as I said. Uh, I know my review, um, I, I would like to review it more carefully. Uh, although my review was pretty careful last night, and as I said, I didn't see other items necessarily, but I yeah. did want to make sure Karen has a chance to review it fully. Um, and, you know, any I, other suggestions? I had, or, oh. I, had, I had one area that I feel like um, maybe we wanted, you know, 
toot our horn a little bit more than we do in this draft, which is on page three, the very first bullet, just about the the, the vote to shut down the, you know, the establishments, et cetera. There was a tremendous amount of work that it went in from in particular uh, in this commission and the licensees in terms of coming up with the guidelines yes. for the reopening. And so it'd be great to have a specific reference in that paragraph to the work and the uh, production of that set of guidelines. Because I do think, particularly where the governor then, you know, the satisfaction with the depth of the guidelines meant they stood on their own. Um, I think that's worth highlighting. I agree. And so maybe you could provide that edit to, sure. um, to Enrique. I, I, sure. I felt the same way. Um, it was accurate, but I do think that it was quite, um, it was really something that we can be extremely proud of that the work of the team to be so thorough um, in, in such a complex industry that um, we got that nod. So yeah, I like that. I like you that were lot. specifically, I'm sorry, you were specifically talking about which section? Um, on page three, where you say the highlights where you write during FY20, the commission, and then you number the list, the very first one, when you talk about the shutdown and the reopenings. Um, yes. Is I, I can maybe give you a, a rewrite suggestion or, or something to consider on number one that pulls in the work that was done on the guidelines. Yeah, and the convening oh, of good. two working groups, um, right. you know, internal and external. I th think that that was work that really helped um, be a, really seamless in, in all of this. So I like that a lot. Yeah. Sounds good. Now, would you want to keep it? But part of the challenge with, um, and this is totally self-imposed, doesn't have to change, doesn't have to be this way. Uh, I've tried, we've tried in the past to keep uh, the letter to the, from the chair, which is where this section is, mm -hmm. the major milestones, as well as the, um, for anticipated for next year, to keep them to one page. Um, and so um, we, they don't have to. Uh, we well, could I do, guess I we was could trying be, like we could the, be a lot more inclusive of, you know, flesh out a little bit more, a lot of what we might, did. There might be ways also to just tighten up, if it's other realistic, areas. one page, there might be a way to tighten up other areas so that we stick with that yep. format too. There's probably a way to do that. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Madam Chair, just to, to jump in, first of all, to... Uh, to Commissioner Zun, thanks to Commissioner Zunigan and the whole team for their great work pulling this together. I know this is a, a, a big task every year. Um, you know, to his point, we want to get it right. We want to have you know the best report that we can present. And understanding that we're we're kind of going into a shift, right? There are some legislative members who are leaving. There will be a new group that'll be coming in, in in January that we'll want to make sure also get this report to talk about what the commission has been doing. Um, the one thing that stood out for me, and again, Commissioner, you just talked about uh, an effort to kind of keep that first page, the, the chair's letter and the milestones for next year. Um, and you reference it in other places in the report, but I'd like to see a little more mention being given to the PPC renewal. Uh, this started at the beginning of the year. It was a huge team effort even before the COVID piece hit us. It was the first time that we've gone through a license renewal. Um, and you can almost say it was an anticipated milestone for 2021 because obviously the official action came in the new fiscal year. Um, but I'd, I'd love to see that obviously under the big dark cloud of COVID, but that was... Um, I think one of our major milestones for the year, and it truly was a team effort and uh, involved a lot of folks and involved a very public process. So I don't, I don't want that to be lost on the people reading this report. So I'm also willing to help you offer some language on that and pull it maybe in from other sections as well. But I think that was a, a prominent milestone for the last fiscal year. Yeah, we are perhaps a little too succinct when we mentioned that relicensing here. Um, I could actually, to Commissioner O'Brien's point, take out a couple of things that um, elsewhere, you know, like the promulgation of regulations, you know, I think um, it happens every time, so it's not as, as relevant to this year. Uh, and, and perhaps the more important 
features of this year and highlight the relicensing and the, the way we dealt with um, the closures given the COVID are a, a lot more relevant. And I don't know if we can roll it over into another air that more regular work because we can't discount it, right? Um, if we put that somewhere else in the document. I, yeah, yeah, it would, yes, it would be, here, here's the operating assumption um, that um, the majority of people who look through this report will go through the first couple of pages and then it will, the, the, the readership would probably drop off or, or become kind of like more um, depending on what somebody might be interested in, let's say. Mm -hmm. And so, and so we try to use the real estate of the executive summary, if you will, which in, in our case is the letter for the chair, from the chair uh, as an introduction um, of what this report contains and the major milestones anticipated as a, as a window into, you know, effectively the year that we already have way through um, as kind of like the, what is likely going to be read by somebody who's gonna, you know, who's gonna really look into it. It's, I think it's not gonna be a lot of, a lot of tweaking, but just some enhancements, which is good. The fact that we can enhance and highlight some of our uh, team's great work, I think that's excellent, so. Um. So I, I have a process question, because I have been for the most part uh, operating over here as, a, as the editor, if you will the good work that, that came from a lot of people. Um, was, as, as you suggest, uh, providing language uh, on any of these sections, could we do it outside of a public meeting, Todd? Maybe this is a question that we don't have to resolve right now, or somebody else takes the comments from my fellow commissioners and incorporates them in a way that is not uh, me, frankly, being, uh, you know, uh, another commissioner who expresses another opinion by the way we word things. How could we? Uh, how could we effectuate this? Aren't we kind of memorializing this public uh, discussion, and and then and then we'll then when it comes back to us, it will be again. It will be affirmed. Okay. Well, so does that, so does then, that work, Todd? I yeah, I was like, going to say just about the same thing. As long as you're just editing the areas that you're talking about right now, then it's not really expressing an opinion outside of a public meeting. You've already expressed these opinions. Okay. Um, and furthermore, it's just one commissioner communicating with one commissioner at the moment. Uh, so that wouldn't be an issue. Either. Okay. So send me, uh, send me the sections that you think and I'll, frankly, I'll probably just put them the way they are. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and then the, the draft would just, and be like a red line. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the way, the the SharePoint, uh, which you mentioned earlier, um, Kathy is tre tremendous tool. So we keep all the revisions. We can make them. You know. Right. Um, it's just that I think we're not supposed to be participating in that because of the. No. No. I know. I know. I guess I meant. I meant to say that you know there's there's um, the ability to save and, and and look at the history at any time. Yeah. So that's a great, I wish that we could look at it, you know, it would be really helpful, but I understand we can't. So that's, you're the beneficiary of that uh, for right now, Enrique. Uh, so right. are we- By the way, we, in, in the future, there could be two commissioners doing this effort, by the way. Which <laughs> <could help. laughs> if there's some volunteers, I'm taking volunteers, uh, I not just one. Uh, I know. Say, that's, that's, I deserve that, that's fair. <laughs> We're always, we're still, we're unbound by the two commissioner rule. Any further comments or questions on this? No, great right. work. Great, great work. work. Yeah, really great work. good work. Thank you. And thanks so Team much. Effort. Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, that's why uh, for Karen, your team has been contributing. And so I want to make sure that, you know, you've had the chance to also contribute. <laughs> In other words, you can't escape it either. Right, so, uh, fair enough. Thank, you, thank you. Thank you so much. I um, appreciate that. And I think, uh, Karen, the, the last bit of operational work would be to see if we should try to convene a meeting in between 
Um, if commissioners are comfortable, we do have a holiday coming up. I want to be cognizant of yeah. that. Um, otherwise, you know, we would look for December 3rd to um, be able to bring back what is pretty much a polished, you know, final document for our consideration. I think that might be, that sounds like it might work for you, Enrique. I think it, 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 it will. Um, if we, provided that we don't do, um, you know, a lot of iterations and I don't anticipate them. Right. Um, but if we, if we come with a thought through, um, you know, as alternative to what we've already discussed or anything new that might come up as in actual draft red line language, yeah. then that could be a very um, straightforward review, you know, with, uh, with, with our time frame. Okay, great. All right, so that's just um, something for us to chew on. And uh, otherwise, maybe we, we do a, a, um, a one item meeting before December 3rd. You know, that's a Thursday. Maybe it's on the, you know, the Monday or Tuesday or something. Okay. All right. Um, other commissioner updates. Um, Madam Chair, I just, uh, I'd like to note. Oh. No, nope. I have one okay. too. <laughs> you go. You go um, first. Hope it's no, not mine. I just, I just wanted to note yesterday, I had the great opportunity to sit in with uh, uh, Mark and Teresa, the Game Sense team, the Mass Council, and our licensees talking about the, you know, the Game Sense program. Uh, incredible work still goes on. What uh, amazed me is that they just don't focus on Responsible Gaming Week or, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of designated months that we've looked at, but they really have a great conversation about promotional opportunities coming up, you know, things that e they can either, either affix a stick or two or some swag to that aligns with our licensees promotions. Uh, and it's just great to see this work still going on and, uh, and the great cooperation that our licensees offer. So it's a privilege to be invited into those two meetings yesterday and listen to all the good work that's going on. Yeah. Teresa does a great job uh, convening uh, um, those meetings. I see that North popped in. I don't know, North, if you were able to join that uh, meeting yesterday, but uh, Commissioner um, Stebbins points out that there, the level of cooperation is from all of the licensees on the GameSense programs is very, uh, it's consistent and um, appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, no, I was not able to attend that meeting yesterday, but I did receive your message last night congratulating some of our team members who had been recognized for incorporating the GameSense program into their daily responsibilities and made sure that their direct supervisors were aware and that we noted their efforts. That's great. So um, what North is referring to, as you, if, as you probably remember, are the um, GameSense Excellence Awards that um, are done quarterly. And um, I thought bringing some great good news to North on one of his first days was <clears throat> helpful. So Teresa um, coordinates that outreach and I, I get the pleasure of providing it to the, the general managers who, um, who, who has been identified on the, uh, the casino employee side as, as really being a partner um, of promoting responsible gaming through the GameSense program. So that happens quarterly. Uh, and I, I have to say that's actually it, when I we had a little pause on me writing the handwritten notes, and I said to Teresa, I've got those Game Sense notes available, and I like doing it. So it's actually a, a real treat to be able to, to send those uh, notes out to the uh, award recipients. It happens quarterly. So um, we're delighted, North, that that's good news for you to spread early on. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So. I raised my hand not knowing that you had something. I'm sorry, Bruce, but that's um, no really, really um, important. And, and um, kudos to Teresa uh, for, for um, convening those meetings so consistently and um, to all the licenses for their cooperation. So I have, uh, nobody else has any other? Uh, no, if I could, man, I just need to leave the meeting. My son is, needs to be picked up. So um, I'm just gonna hop off a few minutes. Okay. Or, I apologize. Thanks. Thank you so much. You'll hear the you'll you'll hear this through the news. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, you. Commissioner O'Brien. Good luck to your son. Thanks. So I'm just uh, delighted that uh, the timing worked out that um, we are able to announce that Governor Baker did appoint a new chair to the 
Game, um, Gaming Policy Advisory Committee, we refer to as GPAC. Um, Governor Baker appointed last week, and it's uh, all now uh, something we can share publicly, a uh, Meg Mazur uh, Cohen, who has been president and executive director of the Back Bay Association since 2000 and has an extensive track record of community involvement, most recently having served as chair of the Boston Finance Commission from 2012 um, until just earlier this year. She also has extensive um, background with other communities, uh, similar roles as the one that she currently holds for the Back Bay Association. And um, I am very pleased that to welcome Meg. I've had the, the pleasure of speaking with her in advance as she considered um, the um, opportunity. And I'm even more delighted that she, when she decided to accept that she had recognized that Jill was part of our team because she also has a, not surprising, a longstanding uh, relationship with Jill. Um, and so uh, again, with uh, using Jill as uh, a very much a utility player and uh, um, uh, with her uh, great uh, external relationship, we are going to have Jill work with us on um, the GPAC relationship and making sure that that goes forward uh, under the leadership of um, Chair uh, Manger Cohen. So Jill will be, I think you're gonna be meeting with Meg tomorrow. And I, I believe Sarah has been coordinating, so there'll be a public announcement of this great news. So we have that, um, that leadership in place and we appreciate the governor's office. They were very thoughtful in making this selection and, and uh, we're very lucky. It's a as you know, a, a committee that's statutorily mandated, it includes legislative leadership and municipal leadership and um, community representation through uh, private and, and public sectors. So uh, that's with this chairmanship uh, announced, uh, I know that um, Meg will be able to move forward and, uh, and convene this important committee that provides, as you know, advice to us and also provides um, advice uh, to uh, Mark's team because they actually, by statute, have uh, that committee does um, review the um, the research um, agenda framework. So we're happy that this work can can now launch. So thank you, Jill, for that partnership. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Great. Any um, anything else? I uh, was like. I, I know we're excited. running a little bit um, later than anticipated, but I have a, a, one one more quick update. Um, okay. Sorry about I, that. Uh, no, no. The, the, I um, I attended um, the the symposium for the National Council on Problem Gambling. This um, it ended this last uh, uh, Friday. Uh, it was a little bittersweet because this this symposium is normally in in July in person, and it was done now over you know two different weeks on a Friday Saturday uh, Friday uh, Thursday Friday on the last couple of uh, weeks, um, and of course everything you know on, online via WebEx, um, and um, there was there was a session that was uh, I I thought really interesting and one that brings up questions that we should think about. Um, and that is the way uh, companies all together around the country, but some mostly gaming companies, as in games for fun, um, are, are really targeting and finding customers in a very efficient way, given all the algorithms of um, social media apps and, and, uh, and technology companies that, that allow um, allowed to be targeted very efficiently. It, this brings up a lot of questions or, or, or issues uh, relative to responsible gaming, uh, especially with, um, with minors. Even interestingly, um, a lot of the people uh, gaming, I seen just, just for, for fun online, the average age is, is, is 31 years old. It's not necessarily uh, minors that are, that, are, that are doing it. But, there's a lot of talk about how that um, how marketing is being so effectively targeted 
at, um, at potential customers. Um, there's themes arising around, again, around the country relative to those uh, jurisdictions that have approved sports betting. The, the marketing has exploded, especially if there are um, tools that are available online. Um, because of course, it's a marginal cost for, um, you know, every time that you advertise, um, you know, to a potential customer who all, all they have to do is pick up the, their mobile and, and, and gamble. Um, again, there's, there's a, lot of, um, um, a lot of trends emerging that we ought to, uh, to be thinking about in case this, this were to happen here. So um, I think um, there's, 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 a, there's more for us to learn and talk about, especially when it comes to the, to the topic of targeted marketing, which is happening more and more in a very efficient way. Yeah, you had brought that up with our meeting with Mark, and it it, uh, it sounds fascinating. And um, I think that we should probably think about our regulatory role on those on on those matters. We we talked about it recently too, um, with respect to whether certain communities might be targeted, et cetera. So uh, I think I think maybe uh, for the agenda city meeting, Commissioner, we might want to think about. You know, how do we start to, do we have a role? Do we start to address yep. anything affirmatively? Yep, I'm, I'm absolutely. And by the way, I should mention that there's, I, I was not referring to gambling companies, casino companies targeting uh, 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 people in, in a way that's concerning, certainly not here, not to no. my knowledge. No. But okay. the point is that the industry as a whole, uh, gaming is, is the, the precursor, again, the, the, the the play for fun, no, not money, um, uh, you know, element or or you know, uh, type of um, games, um, but they they start to get sort of blurry when you put in what what we all know about like you know the, the loot boxes or the skins, something that you can trade and becomes valuable, um, etc. But uh, yeah. We should, we should think about um, how to have a discussion that continues to inform us in this topic, especially as they continue to evolve. My first thought was to think about a particular section of our responsible gaming framework where this could fit. And there is one, one strategy relative to marketing um, right. to, 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 you know, to elicit those discussions. Yeah, at least to be, we should start becoming more and more aware whether we take any formal action at this time. Right. right. Up to really interesting. And thank you for attending that. And yeah, it's really, uh, it, it, it's really interesting, you know, the, the trends that you begin to see from, from one year to the next, um, or recent years, frankly. Yeah. Um, it's not surprising as well. We had many more commission updates and I, I was so excited to give mine. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it was good news. Um, and all of this was actually excellent. Good, good news. Um, so uh, uh, we're ending on a, on a high point. In fact, the whole, the whole uh, meeting today, um, as always, so, so productive. Um, with that said, is there anything else? Commissioner Cameron, are you all set? I am all set. Thank you. Commissioner Stebbins, are you all set? I'm all set, Madam Chair. Thanks. Okay. And uh, Commissioner Zunick, I'm, I'm assuming you're all set. I'm not sure about Commissioner O'Brien. God bless her. She's out navigating uh, um, the, uh, the virtual and hybrid world of uh, education. Um, I know many of you have that challenge. I didn't see Shara, anyone come in today to, to have to get a sign off on their iPad. Um, no, that was earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, um, we love that. So uh, again, um, commissioners, I know that you want to extend a, um, a, a happy Thanksgiving to our entire team. Let's see, we have so many who have stayed on today. Um, we have 40 members of our team. We know that, that um, you're, you're probably listening and working at the same time and tending to all the 
the uh, home responsibilities that you're juggling. So uh, thank you for being part of today's meeting and for all the work that you did to contribute to the success of the meeting. Most of all, um, I wish you um, well for next week. It will be a different, a different deal for us as we probably are separated from family um, in a way that we haven't for, you know, been for years. But again, this will not be forever. And so take all the precautions that will allow future gatherings to be healthy and safe. Commissioners, would you like to close? Any no, comments? that's well put. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody, even if it's uh, bittersweet because we're far away from family, but we can connect um, in ways like this, and that's better than not. So um, I hope everybody gets to get uh, a little bit of a break and some turkey and celebrate the traditions that we can celebrate. And Commissioner Cameron, Commissioner Stebbins. Just well said, happy Thanksgiving. Same, happy Thanksgiving. Everybody stay safe and healthy. And with that, Motion I move to, to adjourn. adjourn. Well, I second that. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner uh, Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes. Thank you. Four, um, four, zero. Thank you, Shara. And thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.